Hello and welcome back to the third symposium session as part of Insonic 2020 Synthesis. My name is Yannick Hofmann and I'm hosting this session. The last two days were already fully packed with talks, discussions and two amazing concerts. And today we will get presented with even more artistic works and performances settling at the intersection of music and sound art. We have a growing community enthusiastically discussing on Telegram and you are cordially invited to join us. The link is here projected on screen. 
Let's jump right into the third session. This one will touch upon topics as diverse as machine learning, obscure robotics, interactive music performance, and sonic spatialization. The sonic spatialization software Zirconium has been developed at ZKM since 15 years. It is the brainchild of Ludger Brümmer, who is the head of the ZKM Herz Lab. With the following talk, Ludger Brümmer, artist and software developer Dan Wilcox, and programmer Pierre Ritt will provide an overview on the latest version of Zirconium. After a quick glance at today's schedule, it'll be their turn. So let's go. Hello, welcome to the Insonic 2020 uh, Zirconium uh, Herz Lab uh, update. Uh, we are uh, a team of several developers in uh, developing the uh, software Zirconium. And let me tell you a little bit about the history of Zirconium. Uh, it began in the year of 2003, where I had, uh, as a head of this department of music and acoustic, I had uh, the idea that we could in implement a big system of spatial music, the best of the world. And we came up with the idea of a sound dome and implemented a small dome for uh, the guest artists. But before we did this, we tried to implement a very big, uh, high-quality dome in the Kubus of the ZKM. And this dome, until now, consists of uh, 49 speakers and four subwoofers, so it's like 49.4 system, uh, using a Maya Sound uh, UPJ-1P speakers plus 700 HP uh, subwoofers. And uh, the question was, we wanted to implement uh, an entire system, uh, not only uh, some speakers. Uh, we wanted to, to help the computer, uh, to help the composers to, to be able to address several rooms, uh, several numbers of speakers, several geometries. Uh, and uh, we didn't want that the composers are only relying on the Kubus as a place to present their compositions. So we need to create an entire infrastructure which enables the, comp uh, the composers to compose and uh, perform their pieces. So we need a, a software which uh, deals with the input of sounds, with the configuration of, of uh, the speakers and uh, with probably interactive, live interactive controlling data or live interactive sound data. And as an output format, uh, the desire was to create a binaural output uh, for headphone, for the working process, and as well as uh, the sound dome output format. So we started to program uh, Zirconium. And the first version of Zirconium uh, started to work in 2005. We had already our first concert in 2005. And uh, it was a standalone app, and it was developed by Chandra Shekha Ramakrishnan and uh, uh, um, supervised and uh, conceptualized by me, by Joachim Gossmann and Götz Dipper. And the elements of this first version is a path editor, uh, which uh, defines all the movements of the sounds, all the sounds used, and uh, which uh, speaker configuration is used. And this creates the output uh, to the sound dome. Uh, along with the path editor, we need a speaker editor, and this speaker editor uh, needs uh, to define the uh, geometry of the speaker. So where in the space is the speaker located? And um, we worked for a while with uh, Zirconium 1, and it is still working. Uh, until It's working until macOS 10.14, but since the change to 64-bit, we cannot use it anymore in the future. So we had to think um, of something else, even though this second version uh, came up in 2009. And the motivation was 
that we um, wanted to connect Max much better, the software Max MSP much better with uh, Zirconium and we introduced a server system, server client system. Uh, the server is a Max uh, and a GUI on top uh, together with um, um, a path editor basically. And the developer was David Wagner. Here you see a picture of the uh, version MK MK2 Zirconium. This is uh, basically the server uh, and and the player. Yeah, it, it's only the server. Yeah. In the next picture, you see the speaker setup. You see it's quite different to the ones before. We have a really great 3D geometry and uh, the. Um, all the definitions needed to define the server as well as the output patches. Um, this is only the element of the server uh, where you see the activation of the speaker. So when you have sounds, uh, um, uh, 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 they are displayed in, in the sources and the speaker are highlighted when they get an amplitude. And uh, here you see the path editor, which is um, uh, quite similar to the former, but it has some extensions. So let's continue to uh, Zirconium MK3. Uh, we started Zirconium M MK3 uh, when Shikashi Miyama uh, joined the team and he is an expert in PD and we wanted to make an open source or at least a uh, 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 public domain uh, version of uh, Zirconium because Max was not free software but PD is uh, free software. So it was a good idea to continue with PD and uh, Shikashi Miyama started with his development, created a concept and then later Dan Wilcox took over and he continued the development and introduced uh, quite a lot of stability and uh, feature is issues. And he will talk later about this. And uh, the application, uh, and this is a new uh, element, the application is in the context of several other uh, applications which serve uh, different purposes. Two, we know already we have uh, again a speaker, a different uh, newly designed speaker editor um, and we have a newly designed path editor with a different representation of movements and uh, speakers. You see here for the first time that the movement is displayed as a trajectory. So you could see the time evolution of the um, sound uh, being marked or being present at one time. Uh, and uh, here a very new feature, we introduced uh, the CircPad uh, remote controller. You could control um, the movement of sounds in real time uh, with an iPad or similar device. Uh, or you could even use uh, several devices uh, connected to Zirconium to, uh, um, to guide the movement of the uh, sounds. As well, we introduced a, a player, a video player, which is able to uh, run uh, um, synchronized uh, video, high, even high resolution video to the audio, uh, multi-channel audio version. And uh, basically what is missing is we did not address complex uh, geometries. Uh, uh, we focus mainly on a kind of spherical uh, uh, position of the speaker. And we did not address yet uh, DBAP, uh, distance based amplitude panning, which is a quite a different algorithm to VBAP. And of course missing is a uh, movement interchange protocol. Um, so this was the first part for me. And I introduce now Dan Wilcox, who will, into, uh, who will show the new developments uh, in Zirconium. So thank you, Ludger. Uh, my name is Dan Wilcox. I'm an artist, engineer, uh, musician, performer. Um, I'm working in software development here for the Hertz Lab. And one of the big projects we work on here is Zirconium. So current development with Zirconium 3. So Zirconium 3 st started again by Dr. Shikashi Miyama. In 2015, uh, I took over development in 
fall, summer of 2017. So just to overview, if you've not used Zirconium 3 or just looking into it now, um, the main interface is on the left side, you have editable tables for sources, IDs, events. Um, on the right side, you have the dome view, which is basically showing the speaker layout and the movement of sounds over time. Underneath, you have the motion view where you can edit um, acceleration and uh, span, basically how wide the virtual sound source is. And below, you have an event view, which shows you sort of a timeline and the events arranged on that timeline. OK, now, Zirconium 3.5 and 3.6. So the focuses on these two were usability and capability. Um, this was also done with a lot of debugging and feedback from users. Um, again, guinea pig university students, um, the university students bringing their projects to the Next Generation Festival here, the eighth version of that. Also with our partner institutions, we gave workshops and concerts it, with the Easton DC EU project. Um, and again, we always have very many visiting artists coming and using our tools here. So one usability aspect we wanted to improve was auto connection. Before auto connection, if you wanted to create multiple IDs or you wanted to work with groups and quickly add uh, IDs to a group or create events that were all related to the same ID, you kind of had to basically create the ID, the group of the event, and then you had to add all the stuff by clicking lots of times. With auto connection, there's a quick way to basically say, all right, repeat the same action, make the same ID, but increment to the next channel. Or select these groups and make a new, uh, sorry, select these IDs and make a new group with all those IDs in it. Or make a new event that's basically just following the next event. And you can basically do that with holding the Option Alt button and clicking on the Add buttons. So here, if I hold Option Out and click, it basically will create <clears throat> new IDs that are connected to the same default input source and increment to the next channel. So click, 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 click. I now have 16 IDs that are connected to the same live input source, but it's connected to channels 1 to 16 without having to manually do it. Now, if I select multiple uh, IDs and I create a new group holding Alt, Option Alt, it then creates a group that has all the IDs in it. Now, it doesn't set the master ID. That's up to you but it saves the trouble of having to create the group and then manually select each ID to be part of it. For events, if you hold Option Out while creating a new event, it basically will make a clone of the previous one and add it to the end. That way you can sort of quickly create events that are already connected to the same IDs. And it tries to place them just basically after the last one with a default duration of 10 seconds. OK. so. <laughs> A next rather uh, painful thing, which is not completely fixed, but we're hoping that this is something that mitigates it, is, OK, we get it. Zirconium 3 does not have undo. We know, living dangerously. Um, so in the meantime, before we basically go through and very carefully make, implement undo and make sure everything works really well, which will take some time, something on our list. But in the meantime, uh, from a suggestion from a workshop uh, at, uh, in Stockholm, was someone said, hey, there's this program called Touch Designer, which will save an, an automatic timestamp file every time you save. That way, you always have a backup. So I thought, why don't we steal that idea? And I added something called auto versioning to Zirconium. And basically, all it does is whenever, if you have it enabled, whenever you save, it saves another copy of the project file. So we can always go back. And you can see when it's timestamped. It works relatively simply. So if you go and save as normal, it basically just saves to the, to the one project file. If I go under File and turn on Auto Versioning, now when I save, it basically saves a cop copy of the project file itself with a timestamp, and it updates the actual save file. So whenever you save, it always updates the, the normal, the, 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 the sort of the source file, and makes a timestamp. So if you open up an older timestamp and then start working from there, it will also update the, the new one. That is on you. There's no sort of branching or anything fancy about that. But at the very least, you have a state that you can go back to without having to manually go and say version 2, 4, 6, whatever. You can just turn on auto versioning, work through the hard patch, and then you have something to go back to. So we know it's no replacement for undo, but it's something, right? OK. So uh, another new feature added to Zirconium 3.6 is event path smoothing. 
Um, and what this basically does is allows you to uh, select the nodes and, and compute a nice path that would move through them to give you a smooth curve. Before, if you would just click, 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 we get, of course, angular lines, dot, 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 very pointy. But let's say I want a nice smooth line. And the computer can do some math to figure that out for us. So an example of that is to select the nodes, right click on the dome view, and you have a new smooth path option. Conversely, you can straighten the path of the selected nodes. That will basically then reset the, the computed BZA curve handles back to the, the over the point. And you can also select sub nodes. You don't have to do the whole path. And basically all it does is the computer computes what's a good position for the BZA curve handles to come out to get a smooth curve or to go back into the node to make an angular straight lines. All right, uh, we've also improved with Zirconia 3.6 the event path transform rotation. So before you could select a path and you could kind of finically grab the edge of the little rectangle and turn it, but it was kind of, you couldn't tell which way you're returning and it would rotate in different directions and oh, yes, we know it was a pain. Um, so this is a bit more simple. If you hold shift while grabbing the corner, then it should be a bit more intuitive as to which direction you're rotating it. In some ways, this is not perfect, but I feel like this is a pretty good improvement. If I want to swip it 180 degrees, it should be more obvious to see how it works. OK, so capability improvements of the last two versions. Uh, live bounce, this was something that came about from a guest artist or not a guest artist, but an artist moving from Mark II to Mark III was saying, hey, with Mark II, I used to be able to just stream audio from one application into the server, and then I could record it live. Um, and we realized that that wasn't working with Zirconium 3.5. So no, sorry, 3.4. So I updated this to work with 3.5. Uh, basically, what it, what it, what it, all it does is when you go to bounce, you can say, wait for a live input. So an external trigger, like from an OSC message starting playback or a MIDI sync clock or time code that starts to play. And that will actually start the recording process. And this is basically an option that's hidden sort of in the bottom of the live bounce, the, sorry, the bounce dialog. It's called wait for sync. And that basically just says, wait until I get a signal to go. OK. Um, another big change which came with 3.5, um, which you may not have noticed right away if you've never used recording, um, is basically each ID on the event view now has a little button underneath the mute and solo buttons. It's the R button, and that's to record arm. Uh, before to record, you had to basically go into the, uh, the ID list and select a couple of IDs. And then when you would record, those would get the recorded uh, event sent to them. That is not intuitive. That was sort of hidden. Um, so now we added a little button that should make it a lot easier. You also have some control of the, if you're going to overwrite existing events. It's the R button, and that's um, to and you can also arm. automatically smooth the events after they're rendered. We'll see how that works. So it's a little hidden, but if you expand the default size of the of the IDs, there's the R button. You can turn on the R button. I enable record. I start playing. Now this is mouse recording. Just drawing on the dome view, you basically. Send paths in. And any sort of drop in time or when you let go of the mouse, that renders the uh, path to an event. So here are the recorded paths. And you can see <clears throat> with mouse recording, you can get some really nice gestures very quickly. You don't have to click, click, click with the mouse always. You can just, in fact, draw. OK. So um, this is another element uh, that has existed, uh, as Ludger said, for a while, since the beginning of Mark III, around 2016, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, this has been free on the, on the Apple App Store. This is called application called ZerkPad. And basically, it synchronizes with the Zirconium project for live ID and group control. Um, it shows you sort of the speaker uh, setup and the live amplitudes of the IDs as they're playing. Uh, and I recently updated a version of this to 1.2 which is updated for newer iOS and iPad OS versions. So it should be more or less stable and running for the foreseeable future. All right, an example of how this works if you haven't tried it or haven't seen it. So here's a Zirconium project. This is synced onto a Zircpad running on an iPad mini. So as I move one of the IDs, you see the corresponding ID moving on the dome view in Zirconium. 
Now, just like mouse recording, I can also, <clears throat> sorry. Now with playback, you can see the live output of the speakers and the amplitude of the ID. And we can move from additional IZs. You can do multiple fingers at once if you want. All right, now for recording. So if recording is on and the ID track is armed, we can grab and send gesture data, similar with the mouse, but from an iPad. Now, the interesting thing is you can also have multiple iPads running, all connected to the same Zirconium project, and you can record multiple tracks at once, maybe from multiple people. And the output from that, once it's running, gives you pretty nice gestural representation, I believe. OK. So if you haven't seen that before, maybe it's something that's worth trying out. OK. Now, current development. Zirconium 3.7. This is where we're hoping to release uh, in the next month or two or in the spring of 2021. The focus of this development is on usability and compatibility. OK. Usability. To cover this section, I want to introduce uh, PR Heat our, uh, I guess you would say intern, but uh, I prefer a system developer on this project. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the usability and the new features added to Zirconium 3.7. So we added um, um, a feature that now the user can add a point between two existing anchor points. So before the user could only add a point at the end of uh, a pass. And now you can add a point by double clicking on the mode and um, the dome view, and it will add a point to the nearest curve. And the user can also double click on an anchor point and it will expand the, the handles and basically does the same thing at the, as the uh, smoothing that Dan explained before. We also added a precise um, uh, adding point in the motion view so the user can right click and it will um, expand um, a small menu and uh, it will compute the values that were um, the user clicked. And you can add a point with a precise time so that the user can have uh, several events with, uh, are synchronized because the, um, it does things with a precise time. Um, we also fixed the multiple event selection. So now the user can uh, click on several events by pressing shifts and it will select them. And you can also uh, use the, the drag and select to have multiple events selected, so he can move them, and he can also resize them or delete them. Like resize and delete. So we also added a gain pass, which is uh, on the same spot as the span pass and the motion pass. So um, basically, it's a value between um, 0 and 1 or 0 and 2, so we have to figure that out. And so Dan will now talk about uh, compatibility with Zirconium 3.7. Thank you, Pierre. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, our focus on compatibility with this new uh, 3.7 development. So we have a lot of projects that are built with Zirconium Mark 1. Again, this project is going all the way back to 2005. Um, one problem with this is it's an older code base. It was focused on 32-bit. We have 32-bit builds. Um, we don't have 64-bit builds, um, and it also no longer runs on Mac OS 10, 15 plus, which is 64-bit only. Of course, going forward, it also will not run on Intel, uh, sorry, Mac ARM chips. Um, the thing with this is it has such a long life that we have quite a number of Mark 1 projects, and we have a number of people that are still interested in composing in the way that Mark 1 worked. So basically, what we're looking on is Im improving the Mark 1 uh, project compatibility within Mark 3. Um, already for a couple of versions, going back to before 3.4, uh, Zirconium Mark III could import Mark I projects. Now, this has been improved a little bit, and what it does is it basically translates the old sources, IDs, and events into the new style sources, IDs, and events. Um, but one problem right now is that it renders the events as static trajectory paths. Um, why is that an issue? Well. Mark 1 events are basically delta events as in change over time. You would say, all right, here's an event. It has a start. It has an end. 
and every time the interpolation is run, it should move, let's say, two degrees this way, four degrees that way, step, step, step. So it doesn't have a concept of I move along this path. It's more of I do some math each time, and I end up rendering this path on the output. So when you convert a mark, import a Mark 1 project in Mark 3, you get a rendered path. But now you have no way of just adjusting, let's say, let's move instead of two degrees, one degree. You have to manually figure it out and move all the points, which is less than ideal if you're already working with this delta ID. Uh, another thing that we, had to, we have to deal with is <clears throat> Mark 1 supported a number of um, audio formats, which Mark 3 doesn't, currently doesn't inherently support. Uh, Apple CAF files and AIFC, which is a, it's a compressed format, but it can also have uncompressed uh, samples inside. So what I did earlier this spring was I actually added support for these formats, uh, these file formats into Pure Data, uh, the open source project. So we're contributing back um, since it's important and used as the core for the DSP engine of this zirconium. So what we're looking at doing is improving it so that we can work. This is a screenshot from Mark 1, the interface to edit the events. So we have a start, we have an end, and then you have a change in azimuth. You have a change in zenith, which is basically elevation. You have a change in span, the virtual width of the speaker, um, in one direction and the other direction, span, uh, azimuth and elevation. And what we want to do is add a similar interface to Mark 3 that'll, and a new event type that allows you to also compute for each interpolation step a certain amount of movement without being rendered along a path. All right, similarly, we have uh, one of the goals is Mark II project import. Now, the, UE, the base of the UE from Mark III is built on Mark II, so it shares a very similar data model. So theoretically, you should be just, just be able to load an older Mark II XML project. Now, I've tried that. It doesn't quite work. So there might be, need to be some more work in this area, uh, but that's lower priority for us. <clears throat> because there are a fewer number of existing projects uh, focused on Mark II. So apologies if you're on Mark II and you want to just import. That will come, but probably later after Mark uh, version 3.7. All right, so talking about compatibility, hanging over our heads already was the 64-bit transition with Mac OS 10.15. Now we have a transition to a new architecture, which in a couple of years there probably will be no Mac sold that have run Intel chips anymore. So for the foreseeable future, at least for the next, sorry, three or four years, we need to support both Intel builds and ARM 64 builds for Mac. So we're working on some of the back end to be able to build Zirconium 3 for both architectures and with the distribute a universal build. Um, now to do that, we also need to be able to build the external objects we use within the Pure Data Engine inside Zirconium, the VBAP object, the HOA object, the HRTF uh, binaural object, um, as well as we need to make sure that the various uh, uh, external libraries we're using work, such as Jack, Port Audio, et cetera. So it's nothing that you'll see as a user, but it is takes some extra work to make sure all of this works so that we can build and that we know on Intel or ARM that it will work and play back. All right, so some future development ideas. Some people say, hey, I want dark mode support. Why not? Yeah, OK, we get it. It's lower on the list, but I think it should also work. Um, hey, how come on my laptop, on my retina screen, the, the dome view is fuzzy? Well, it's because it's not rendering at high resolution. Um, it would be nice to have that. Hey, I thought I heard OpenGL was going away. Yes, we know. <laughs> we have OpenGL code in there. We want to replace that at some point, maybe with Scene Kit, which is a wrapper on Apple's Metal. Um, some other things to think about is the industry is working towards new spatialized file formats. You have something called ADM, Audio Definition Model. That could be interesting. It's basically a format which includes speaker placement and sound positioning. It would be nice to be able to load a file like that directly in, and it would basically create like an ID automatically from the source and place it for you. I think that could be doable. Um, another option is to I think uh, this is in conjunction with cross-platform support, is to split the main logic of Zirconium as a separate sort of C library that could then do file format, sort of load, create projects, and save projects, and then as well as play them back. And basically, if we separate that from the UE, that would allow us to, for instance, make a player that would run on, let's say, Linux or Windows or allow us to split out uh, large projects to run on multiple projects together, let's say Raspberry Pis things like that. There's an exciting development area if we sort of 
separate the main logic from the Mac OS only UI. Um, there's also, as Ludger said earlier, there's also, hey, newer algorithms that are coming out for spatialization, DBAP, distance space, amplitude panning. Maybe we can add that as an algorithm. Um, also, as Ludger men mentioned, there's expanded layouts. What if we have uh, what I call the cell cellular model, where you have multiple overlapping virtual domes. You have a big project in multiple spaces, and the sound can basically move from one mini dome to another mini dome. And you could basically have irregular shaped uh, sound spatialization areas. I think that could be cool. OK, um, that's it for me. Uh, if you want to check out Zirconium, then just simply go to zcam.de, Zirconium. That is always a live link that goes to the current page. You can download it from there. You just need Mac OS 10.10. .10. And also, if you're really interested and want to keep up with releases and uh, announcements, then please join the Zirconium mailing list, Zirconium list. There's a link to that on the bottom of this page. Thanks. Now back to Lydgar. Thank you, Dan, for your introduction of the new features uh, of Zirconium. It's quite uh, thrilling what uh, we will face and what uh, in the future will happen and what is already there for the newest version of uh, Zirconium 3.7. Now let me show some works, some usage of uh, uh, Zirconium. This, was, uh, uh, this is a picture of Hexadome a project where Brian Eno took place and uh, he uh, composed a special composition for uh, eight uh, channel uh, video in conjunction with the sound dome uh, surrounding uh, the video projection. Here another picture of the implementation in the Berlin Gropiusbau. Then a uh, long time ago, Bernd Lintermann uh, ported his uh, Sono Remorphed interactive 3D uh, um, installation um, into the sound dome and we had the uh, Amazonas Opera using a sound dome. Uh, here are some pictures and we had some several works with the, uh, with the artist Rosalie, the Cellularium, um, where we uh, used the sound dome uh, in the entrance hall in conjunction with a very large display and rhythmic, uh, rhythmical music, uh, uh, rhythmical light, basically. We had a presentation of a piece of Holly Herndon in the Kunstverein with a uh, built up uh, small sound dome with our mobile dome. And we have Rasta Noton presenting their Jubilee uh, white circle in the Kubus, but as well in the Berghain uh, in Berlin. So these were quite prestigious uh, uh, installation of the work. We had a several off uh, development uh, in Matera where we took the idea of the sound home into low, low fi and low um, uh, and, and low money basically affordable for everyone. Uh, we had a 32 channel uh, um, um, single speaker environment. Uh, where we were able to synchronize uh, a, a 32 channel audio system rather simple and uh, we used them in several locations already and had really thrilling ex uh, results. Thank you very much for the uh, for attention and uh, good luck for the next days of the conference. Thank you very much, Ludger, Dan, and Pierre for this nice overview on Zirconium and also for profoundly answering questions in our Health Lab Telegram group. To our international audience, make sure to download the app Zirconium, which you will find on our ZKM website. And Dan Wilcox also posted the link in our Health Lab Telegram group. Stefan Henrich is a robotics designer and architect. Hasan Mashni is an engineer and scientist specializing in computer mathematics. Both have now joined forces to work together on a challenging artistic project. With Occultique, Robotique, Seance AI, the Eastern DC Fellows will present an AI-controlled table-turning robot. Let's go. Hi, in Sonic 2020, we feel honored to speak here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for tuning in. 
So, my name is Stefan Henrich. I have this design and research studio in Stuttgart, Germany, which is called Stefan Henrich Robotic Design and Architecture, which is exactly what I do there, robotics design and architecture. And of course, um, we are doing this residency program at uh, ZKM Herz Labor. Uh, Eastern DC. My name is Hassan Mashni. I'm also like collaborating with Stefan on this resi in, in this residency. I come from a background of being a scientist, a researcher, and an engineer, and uh, basically focused on environmental physics and data science. But in this case, we are wor working on this project in Walk Spirits, which is uh, what we are going to introduce for you right now. Yeah, the project we are developing together is called Occult Robotic Seance AI, and um, yeah. You are here and we are here to let you know more about it. So what is Occult Robotics Seance AI about? Actually it is about evoking spirits. A bit like the spiritists in former time did, but also much unlike the spiritists did. So the spiritists employed a table for table turning. This is also what Seance AI is about. It is about table turning. But unlike the spiritists, it is uh, not using a regular table, but a robotic table. The robotic table we are developing here, right now. Um, also, it is uh, not about evoking a spirit like uh, the spirit of a disease, for example, but the spirit of our times, probably, the artificial intelligence. So the spiritists use the table and sometimes a young person as a medium uh, in a seance AI. The table is table and so the, the robotic table is table and medium in one. There is a lot of similarities between the original approach or the concept how the spiritists used uh, to invoke the spirits using their table turning ceremony. Uh, the similarities to our approach is, is the inputs that uh, are given to the spirit or the medium. The first input being putting your hand on a table and initiating this uh, medium. The second, sp uh, stating your question in a loud voice for the medium to hear, or, and eventually the spirits to hear your question. While the similarities are very obvious uh, in, in the form of, of initiating the ceremony, they couldn't be different. Our table, our table couldn't be even more different than their table. In their case, it was a piece of wood or a simple table that is, that is uh, uh, exists in its own materiality. While in our case, we had to to reinvent or redevise a, a, a very complex machinery for this table and the spirits to appear. Even the French mathematician Faraday had to come up with a technical apparatus to prove his colleague professors wrong that there is no uh, spirit needed to move tables in a table turning seance because his colleague professors imported uh, the occultism from England and the United States into European universities. Um, yeah, it seems as if proving the non-engagement of spirits and implementing this artificial spirit, the AI, is much harder than just to make uh, yeah, the regular natural spirits appear in a table turning seance. Upon putting one's hands on the table, the table starts reading the person's hands using infrared cameras. The choice behind using infrared cameras rather than normal cameras is also pro uh, based on the giving information to the surface that this person really exists. It's also an aesthetical approach uh, that is in contrast to giving the, uh, the table only imagery of a still, li uh, still life. The infrared imagery has a lot of information that the table could use uh, to uh, answer and process the questions stated by this person. So in a sense, we're actually reenacting the original experiment conducted by Faraday to misprove uh, the existence of a spirits or a turning table ceremony. In, in our case, we're reenacting the spirits but using AI or infrared cameras that would convey certain bio, bio inform, biomedical information about a person. Uh, it, but we're misusing. But in this sense, we're actually misusing the original experiment to prove spirits that they exist by relying on, on these new technologies. When it comes to processing the second input uh, of a person attending the table turning ceremony, which is the question, 
that, that this person is stating or hoping to answer. Our approach is not to re recreate or reenact uh, Alexa or Google or any kind of um, system that semantically or uh, logically translates these questions to uh, to certain uh, or co relates these questions to certain co uh, contents. We're actually t trying to, to devise an audio profiling that is, uh, in a way. Uh, creating a cognitive system that is able uh, to understand the state of the person and uh, stating the question. Is, uh, is this person sad, happy, hopeful, wishful? And this information is rather uh, uh, stated with uh, within the uh, the melody or the, the temporality of, of his utterness rather than their uh, logic or semantical translation. Yeah, and then the table starts to pace around. But where does it move to? It has to give an answer somehow, right? So one part of the answer, answer is the gesture of the motion of the robot. It could, for example, move precisely, step length by step length, measuring space, uh, or be uh, to the, as the opposite, being alerted by your inputs, moving chaotically or very fast, left and right. And also a second thing is the, the table will be able to draw, so it will be able to draw figures on the ground that stay there for a short while, ephemerically, and disappear then after a short period of time. So for a short period of time, you will be able to interpret these figures. The robot has very strange legs, right? Also many of them. One could ask if it would have been performing the same thing, just employing three or four wheels. Uh, this is true to some extent, yes. Uh, it would have been moving maybe more reliable and it would have been more easy to, uh, to get this motion. But the physical embodiment of the AI, the artificial intelligence, would have been way weaker, right? So with a leg you can express things. It means something how you put your steps, how you move your legs, uh, almost like in a dance, versus when you use a wheel, the wheel is always indifferent, regardless the angle the wheel is uh, standing. So actually, no, the, the functionality wouldn't have been the same um, if, we have, if we would have used wheels. It would have been less of an animal too. And yeah, we shouldn't forget the animalistic part, which is needed to bridge the here and now to the world of the spirits. In former times, there was, for example, a raven employed to, to bridge this, uh, this gap between the two worlds. Here it is a robot with 18 legs. Talking about bridges, um, the mechanism the leg consists of is, is uh, based on a pussy lipkin mechanism. And this was the latest technology at the time of the Spiritists. Um, it has been used in steam trains to um, translate the linear motion of the, um, of the piston to the rotational motion of the, of the wheels. And in this, um, in this robot, it's not the same mechanism, it's a derivation from that, but it, it works the other way around. So we uh, have a rotation which will be translated to a perfect linear motion, which is actually needed to really read the inputs coming from the hands laying on the desktop without any, without any dis disturbance. To conclude, why are we doing all of this uh, to evoke spirits with the help of a robot? What we're actually trying to do in a nutshell is to reenact an old experiment that was used both by the spiritists to prove spirits, the, the existence of spirits, but also by science to misprove the spiritists, which actually being, where science is actually being the bad person ruining it for the other person. In reenacting this experiment with modern technologies, we're, uh, we're hoping to, to question our desires and aspirations uh, towards these technologies, but also have a, a new understanding develop a new understanding of what spirits are in our new age. So it's building an AI to question the AI with the help of itself, we can say. It's also yeah, question our expectations towards the AI. It's also questioning um, yeah, the way we, we wish or we think that we can delegate uh, tasks or uh, problems to, to the AI, I would say. 
Um, we have to say thank you to sponsors that supported our project until here and also hopefully in the future. Um, thank you to EOS GmbH, thank you to Riva Engineering GmbH, thank you to Mädler GmbH, thank you to Franke and of course, That's thank okay. you. Thank you to ZKM, thank you to Herzlabor from most um, Yannick Hoffmann and uh, Miriam Stürmer who did the connection in the first place. Thanks a lot to our Herzlab remote residents, Stefan and Hasan, for introducing us to this nice and pretty obscure project. What happens if multiple AIs try to find an answer to one of the oldest mysteries of humankind? Are we alone in the universe? Two days ago, we were able to experience the premiere of their latest audiovisual performance. And now we can look forward to many exciting insights into the work of the artist duo Quadrature. Hi. Hi. We are Quadrature. We are a Berlin based duo of artists, and this is Sebastian Neitsch and I'm Juliane Götz. In the last years, we've been working a lot with how humans explore the universe and what kind of stories and speculations come out of this exploration. For the last three years, we've been working on a series of projects that all involve the three same basic parameters, which would be electromagnetic waves from outer space, so radio waves that we collect ourselves with our own different antennas that we build over the years. Then the second parameter would be artificial intelligence that filters that data from space those radio waves. And the third parameter would be, it filters it in the hope to find extraterrestrial intelligence. So we have radio waves from outer space, artificial intelligences looking for extraterrestrial intelligences. We had this generous um, grant for three years now called Hashtag B. Beethoven. It was organized by Podium Festival and has a lot of international partners like the ZKM and there especially the Hertz Laboratory. Uh, we knew that we couldn't do this alone. We couldn't build a radio telescope ourselves, especially also for the artificial intelligence. And also, of course, we, we had to be a bit modest about the whole thing because we were not mu musicians. We did some sound art, but, but we are really from a more contemporary art direction. We built a lot of installations. We, uh, we work very visual, very space-based. Um, so we asked Christian Losert to, to join us. Hi. And then we also asked Sebastian Müller, who was also very, very interested to build a radio telescope. Hello. So we gathered this team. I'm Christian Losert. I'm a composer and creative technologist. My role in this collaboration is to bring the sound side and also this technical approach, especially in terms of machine learning. The task was to transcribe the extraterrestrial data into um, AI learning mechanisms, um, but, but to, to do that in real time. And this was a bit of a, yeah, of a, let's say, learning excursion we did over the, um, over the years where we tackled from one solution to a next to a next and kind of, um, yeah, learned a lot on that way. The first um, concert we did was Fantasy Number no. 1. And there we had this um, opportunity to work with a motorized organ. Our radio telescope standing in front of a church. Inside the church, we transferred the signals of the radio telescope into MIDI nodes. And these were then filtered by various artificial intelligences 
and transcribed to the organ on which a machine called the Orgamat by Klaus Holzapfel was sitting and this Orgamat was able to play the MIDI notes live incoming. There was this mixture, combination, symbiosis of the radio waves, the radio signals that were also audible in the church together with this very traditional church instrument, the organ. And it was kind of using the old interface to the skies, the church, but now playing it with um, the new interfaces to the skies, the radio telescopes. We found a, um, a network um, which is called um, polyphony RNN. The polyphony RNN is quantized. It doesn't need velocity values because um, like a cembalo or an organ, it's just an on-off principle. The node is on, the node is off. The advantage of this is that the network is very good in um, exp um, expressing polyphony structures. And that's what we needed for um, translating an organ in its original way an organ was meant as a polyphony on-off structure system. Fantasy number one was inspired by very traditional structures for classical music pieces. We had it divided in three chapters. The first one was the Ouverture Celestiale. It was kind of the first encounter between the radio telescope and the organ and a direct translation of the frequency bandwidth of the telescope to the bandwidth of the organ. And it was a fast paced, towards the end of the chapter, very messy piece of sound, I would rather call it than music. Then there was this um, second part. We used um, the incoming noise and transformed it uh, through a kind of a harmonization machine in real time. A certain neural network that was called Piano Genie. I have to quote um, Chris Donoghue in that project because he was kind of the architect of this network. And I think it's one of the most convincing real-time applications with machine learning and music we have so far. What does it do? It's based on an, I would call it a bottleneck um, structure, which you see often those kind of compression ideas in machine learning because they do quite magical wrestles. And this is what we actually did with the radio signal. We, 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 we narrowed it down to, in the end, just eight notes in real time that kind of play an adagio version of the sky. The grand finale then was uh, Allegro con Spirito Artificiale. And it was a duet for outer space and artificial intelligence trained on, on, on the Chorale of Bach. So it was actually an almost limited data set we, we had. Even we, we, we put in every Bach choral we found or that existed. We had a limited data set, we had a huge network and we trained it a lot. After like thousands of iterations, you tickle that network towards a so-called overfitting system, which kind of replicates phrases of Bach, but um, or, or polyphony structures of Bach, like 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 almost copying it, but but co copying it in a unique way. So you get, go from one copying part to another, like it's a it's a floating river of Bach. Where, but you don't see where it goes. You, you, you just um, see snippets of it. So we were also really lucky and had the chance uh, to have a concert with the great Ensemble Resonance at the Resonance Song in, in Hamburg. That was really, really beautiful. And there what we did is we used a different antenna because we just couldn't bring the big dish. And we used an antenna which basically gives you real-time data about incoming 
foreign objects burning in Earth's atmosphere. And this signal we also basically channeled to the real-time AI from Christian and made a live party tour of that, which then was played by two musicians. To make this happen, again, we use this um, piano genie um, because it worked so well in real time, but in a different, um, uh, with a different ipro approach, it, it, it really kind of, um, we, we translated um, a, a filtered noise partiture in real time very quickly to a melody line that could be interpreted by an instrumentalist. Um, so. And, and then we had the contrary signal, the original noise that also was translated into a real partiture. We could tweak with those filters of randomness, of um, predictability, of um, scales that get into that get fed into the system, and. So during the whole concert, um, you, you, you gradually got more confident into those harmonics that we fed into it. In the beginning, the artificial intelligence was set to zero, so they, it didn't do anything. It was also the pure noise, but which each, with each hit, with each comet uh, hitting Earth's atmosphere, the artificial intelligence interfered more and more and more. very rough and explosive event that it actually is to a more and more nicer sweeter version of the same event which we also see down here on earth whenever you see a shooting star it's not that you're yeah it's something beautiful and something magnificent romantic, romantic. and this kind of uh, transformation from the physical event to the human interpretation of it was done by the artificial intelligence. My name is Sebastian Müller. I'm an industrial designer. Uh, we're here in my studio at Teufelsberg. Uh, in this project, I mostly worked on the design and construction of the telescope. I did some research before about telescopes in West Virginia, visiting the Green Bank Observatory. And these are huge constructions. Here we wanted to have a mobile, small-scale telescope, which we can easily transport to different locations, set up and eventually also run autonomously with the help of uh, solar panels. So when we started with this project, we had a simple uh, telescope, which we bought from China. And using that, we had the idea of motorizing it. We got a sponsoring by Festo, so we had a very good components to start with. We made a system with two axes uh, steering for horizontal movement and for the vertical axis. So we can basically uh, scan the whole sky, minus seven degrees. So Credo, which is a cosmic radio engine for delusional observations, is basically a paranoid machine which constantly finds 
or readable signals within the noise from the universe. And the machine consists of a quite large, beautiful silver telescope standing in the center of a ring of speakers. And then underneath it, there's, a, there's of course some computers and it has a artificial intelligence and some sound stuff, which try to dream the training data that we trained it on into this noise. It's a little bit like, like Google Deep Dream used to work, if you're familiar with this, just on the audio side of things. So we programmed it the way that at the beginning of each cycle it kind of scans the sky and looks for interesting uh, signals within a little bit of different frequencies all around this H line of 1.4 gigahertz roughly and um, remembers that and then kind of goes again and then goes to different spots where it thought it could hear something and whenever it's there it kind of interpretates it and goes deeper from this raw audio noise into the artificial intelligence. Okay, let's go into raw audio, uh, which is a fundamental shift in thinking because it is a much more dense information. You, for instance, you have uh, audio like uh, 44,100 um, steps. You have just in, within one second of data that you have to process to, to transform some input into an output. We tried out a lot of different uh, machine learning approaches. I think most of them come from speech synthesis. But then there was this young computer science student um, called Marco Passini, who had this new approach, which is called a Melgan structure. A GAN is a generative ad adversarial network, which kind of is borrowed from the image technology. So a GAN is able to analyze a picture and to draw a picture based on that input. That's with a student and teacher architect. The student tries to propose a picture and another network called the teacher is kind of judging if the input image or the generated image is an original or not. And always with this conflict of being just a copy or being an original picture, judging that, the networks get better and better to draw an image and also to yeah, decide if the image is a valid one or not a valid one. And Marco Passini um, used audio in that way as looking into a spectrogram of an audio input and look at a particular outcome of an audio input, which was, for instance, a data set of whispering and a data set of radio telescope noise and comparing those two and forcing um, the machine learning algorithm to draw and spectrogram in style of the whisper. So we could, we could transform an um, audio stream of noise into a translated version of phonemes based on whisper. And that was kind of a breakthrough for us because from there we could experiment again. problem we had with this project is we need training data to train the AI with so it can actually find the EI. But of course we have never found any extraterrestrial intelligence yet so we cannot take any training data from them. So we had to refer back to the only intelligence we so far kind of acknowledge ourselves to be that would be data from human intelligence. So we used, we used music, we used pop culture, we used scientific texts. I read theories of how to find extraterrestrial intelligent life forms so that it would have the necessary scientific background, for example. 
Yeah, but we also use sounds that we humans send out to outer space. Uh, so it's kind of like a very, very complex feedback loop that we built. Also, we developed a kind of cyber shamanistic initiation ritual, which is a performance that takes place at the first evening of the installation. You have a person that's like a shaman or like a priest or like this kind of medium that connects with this interface. Via VR glasses. Not to interpret, but to connect us humans mm. to the skies. Thank you very much, Juliane Götz and Sebastian Neitsch of Quadrature, but also many thanks to Christian Losart and Sebastian Müllauer for their guest appearances in this video. We really enjoyed having Quadrature as our artists in residence. Artistically reflecting on the rise of social bots and identity theft, the media artist and composer Alexander Schubert developed an artistic project as part of a remote residency with CKM Herzlab in collaboration with the German Museum in Munich. We will now present to you Alexander Schubert and his project Crawlers. Let's go. Crawlers is an an anonymous bot collective that secretly works on the internet to scrape data, to crawl user pages, to steal information and images, and then to create an alternate social network of warped truth and altered facts. The bots in the collective of crawlers work on social networks, namely on Facebook, and act as human beings. So they have profiles and they are posting things, they are commenting things, they are sharing things, and they are interacting with other human profiles. While they are doing that, they are scraping all informations, all user data and all images from the befriended accounts, which normally would not be accessible um, if they were not befriended. Like this, they collect and scrape all the data that they can find in order to create a second social network with a slightly altered content. All the data that is being collected, that is being saved, is in the same process altered and slightly changed. So every information that was found on the original profiles now is a bit off. It's always close to being real, but it never really is real. So the resulting data is not being saved exactly like it had been found, but it's like a kind of a parallel universe where everything is a little bit different. The same thing happens with the images. So when this data is being um, created, well, first scraped and then transformed, in the next and last step, out of this data, a second social network is being created, which can be found through the crawler's website. Once that is done, Every um, human profile that is being um, befriended by the bots then gets an invitation link to visit their profile on the alternate social network. The whole process happens without the knowledge of the human, um, of, the human um, 
of the human users of the original social network. So they, um, they are befriending a, a person, um, not knowing that it is a bot, and they are not aware of this process up to the point where they get the invitation link to check out their newly created profile. This process happens on and on, so the bots, the group of bots keeps working all the time um, around the clock and they are trying to find new friends, trying to get more data and constantly build this alternate um, social network. So, obviously it is a, um, a surprise for the um, for the um, for the users um, when they get the link to their uh, alternate profile, and um, we have created it in a way that it is very clear that this profile is about you, even though everything has changed. So there are no a lot of the information that can be found there is not 100% traceable. Every name is slightly altered. Every information is just a little bit off, but it is very clear that um, this process um, is about you or the person in question. So what happens is it is a, um, it is definitely very irritating and um, maybe for some also a frightening um, Inside that all this data that they are using on their private accounts is now available in another context and is being published in this way. So one of the most obvious um, goals of this project is to um, to make people more sensitive towards how easily all the data can be accessed and um, how it can be distributed. So it is um, mostly or to a, to a bigger degree about um, the security of personal data on the web. But it is also about um, how different realities, different truths um, can be created. So the idea here really is not to just show that this is possible, but to also show kind of a different version of yourself or um, a different version that somebody else created out of you or maybe a version how somebody else looks at you. So it's not just the exposition of what it is but it's also the, the framing or the slight transformation of that which might make you consider a bit also how you present yourself or what, um, what is relevant about the characteristics or the things that you say or the images that you share or the way that you look at yourself. So um, it's not just um, a technical demonstration of what is possible, even though that is um, the case. It's also um, it plays with these with this artificial with an artificial world, so to say, some where let's say slightly different rules apply. And it's one thing I in my work in general like is the comparison between different perspectives. And here in this case, you have. A, let's say an alternate profile page of yourself which is um, which is almost the same um, to a certain degree but like on the first look it almost looks the same but it's then it's all those subtle or sometimes not so subtle differences which makes you which gives you the possibility to compare to compare the way you normally would present yourself or see yourself and a different version of yourself so to say and um, for this project, we have used different forms of, well, algorithms, automations, and um, deep learning. It basically falls into several steps. The first one is the, um, is the development of the bots, so of the automated um, profile actions, which is becoming more and more difficult, um, but still is possible. So here we basically automated browser interaction in order to simulate to the social network that a human person would be sitting at a browser, clicking on things, scrolling and things like this. So we're kind of emulating human behavior as good as possible on, on, an, um, on an array of different um, laptops that are standing um, 
in a server room. So all of them have like are switching through different accounts, then um, doing human-like actions. So that's the first part of our development. The second part is the the transformation of the of the material, namely the text and the um, and the images that we're scraping. And here we've used um, deep learning uh, methods in order to well, where for one on the text base we had um, we had trained models that were trained on big um, data sets of text which could when you give it an input text then kind of try to find something that is close to it but not being exactly the same and this is especially helpful if you want to look at the bigger context of a text and um, also see um, what happened before in the text, what happened afterwards in the text. And that is the first, um, the first way of how we used AI in this context. And we've been trying to go back and forwards to do something that, is, that feels fairly real, but there's also still pretty much an, an amount of this kind of uncanny valley feel to it. So some of it also f always feels slightly wrong in a way. And for the images, we tried a similar approach. We did two things. Um, one is a um, reverse um, um, search in which we try to find images based on what we find on the user profiles to find images that are almost the same, but with a bit, um, well, but it, it's a different image, so to say. So let's say if you would have an image of me sitting here on a chair with books in the background um, with a colorful jacket, then we would try to find an image that is of a similar person who almost looks like me. So that is the one way of how we tried to create this, um, this seemingly <laughs> almost um, identical but not quite um, depiction of the um, original profile. And the other thing is that we've been working with um, style transfers in order to also transform the look and the way the image is shaped. So um, the first one is kind of altering the content and the second one is then altering the appearance of it. So We've then been scraping um, big databases of input images and then impose the, um, the aesthetics or the looks of those onto the images in our database. So we've got, like, we've got um, two different um, steps of transformation of the image data. And then we bring everything together, create those, pro um, those profile pages, and we tried to copy the the um, the original social network site almost um, 100% and afterwards we added a few like um, glitches or small alterations so that also that you're not just looking at the content but also at how the things are being presented that everything is always a bit off or moving to the side so just to underline um, these aspects of um, yeah, of this kind of uncanny, um, somehow off presentation. So, <clears throat> why does this interest me? Um, or how does it maybe also fall into the other things that I'm doing? Um, majorly, I'm also doing installations or I'm doing staged pieces. And one thing that in general interests me is like I already mentioned a bit before, the comparison between different perspectives or the switching between different settings or switching between different worlds. So often what I'm interested in is using technology to look at something that is analog or that is um, supposedly real or that is happening in the actual um, um, personal everyday life and then use technology to kind of impose a different look on it or use an artwork to impose a different look on how technology is being used in those contexts. So what I'm often um, after in those pieces is to 
establish a setting, propose it as something that is that is um, that is then accepted as something that's real or that's kind of the analog starting point, and then switching that setting, and by that, for one, reflecting of what you saw before, and then questioning the logics of that, and through the alteration also put the digital transformation in the in the center point and make um, hopefully make you think about this. So in this sense, even though this piece is fairly different as it's only, um, well, there are no performers, there's no uh, staging and things like this. So it in a way falls a bit out of what I normally do, but with respect to the themes or topics that are included, it also fits very well. And in a kind of post-digital perspective, I also see this piece in a way to question how digitality nowadays influences society and our daily life. And in this specific case, it is about the, um, for one, the security of data and the accessibility of personal data. And on the other hand, it's how easily truth can be manipulated and how identities can be warped and changed and so on and so forth. Um, we have been developing this um, project since I think one and a half years by now and um, one side project that came out of it which kind of just used all the musical and artistic aspects um, was the project Avery which um, would just create music and um, write poems and so on while now this project Crawlers is focusing more on the um, more on the social, political and uh, technical aspects and implications um, of this technology. And this project has been developed um, in the uh, remote residency of the ZKM and um, will be part of the Intelligent Museum, also as in, in, in a cooperation with the Deutsche Museum. And what is important to mention is that this has been a team effort of several programmers and people who collaborated on this project, which is namely Steffen Luray for the bot programming, Konrad Kanzlin for the transformation of the data, and Jerai Suarez for the front-end programming. So it's we are <laughs> right now using different servers, which are standing in different locations, and each of those do their specific functions and now we're trying to bring everything together and yeah also we're spreading out the bots over several machines um, so when the first ones will be blocked that we have other machines that are still running many thanks to alexander schubert for sharing intimate insights into his crawlers project with us we are heavily looking forward to experience this hybrid work, both online as well as on site. And actually the exhibition of the work is set up already. And as soon as the current situation allows for it, we will open it here at ZKM. Concluding the session, we once more present to you Janis Sanos from the Union University in Corfu. Janis is a long-term fellow of the European Art Sciences and Technology Network for Digital Creativity. And now he will introduce you to his interactive piece, Contrast Tokyo Walks. And um, here you will find the link and you can click on this and um, then you will just follow the instructions Janus will give you in the video. And then after this video introduction, you still have plenty of time to try out the interactive piece on your own. So enjoy the introduction to Contrast Tokyo Walks. First, on your browser, go to the Soundwood application. Now select Contrasts Tokyo Walks. You will land on the starting point 
of the walk and you can use on the bottom right of the screen the circle to navigate. Thank you, Yanis Danos, for this introduction to your interactive Sonic Walk. The link to this interactive piece you will find here once more projected on screen. So the final symposium session has come to an end now. And coming next, we will have a panel discussion on artificial neural networks in music and sound art. This one will be moderated by composer and AI expert Palle Dahlstedt. And it will feature Rebecca Fiebrink, Artemi Maria Giotti, and Philippe Esling. You might have noticed that I missed to say the name Alexander Schubert. Unfortunately, Alexander Schubert won't be able to make it to this day's 
panel discussion due to a bike accident. So Alex, if you can hear us, we wish you quick, quick recovery. Please get well soon. At 8 p.m., we will then experience the final concert of Insonic 2020 Synthesis. And this one will feature Eastern DC productions hailing from Stockholm, Ljubljana, Corfu, and Cuneo. I say goodbye now to the audience and shortly hand over to Palle Dahlstedt. We will now have half an hour break. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Goodbye. <laughs>
Welcome to the second panel discussion of InSonic 2020 on the topic of AI, neural networks and contemporary and future applications of AI and machine learning in music. I'm Palle Dahlstedt and I will be the moderator of this discussion and I want to start by presenting our uh, honorary guests here. Uh, and first uh, is uh, Philip Essling. You have a background in data mining and machine learning, currently associate professor at IRCAM and the University of Sorbonne. Mm -hmm. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you work with various computation-based approaches to timbre and orchestration, and yeah. you're behind the orchestration software ORCID. And you're currently director of the Artificial Creative Intelligence and Data Science team at IRCAM in Paris. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect introduction. Yeah. And uh, Rebecca Fiebrink is a re reader at the Creative Computing Institute at University of the Arts, London. In your research, you focus on how machine learning can support and expand human creative practices. And you're behind the quite well-known Wekinator machine learning software, and you produced a widely appreciated online class uh, in machine learning for artists and musicians. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, third, we have Artemi Maria Giotti, you're a composer and artistic researcher working in the field of uh, artificial intelligence, musical robotics, collaborative and participatory sound art. And you focus on critical and subversive approaches to AI, viewing it as an extension of human intelligence in the context of human creativity. And you are currently active at the Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics in Graz, Austria. And I should mention that you also got the Gigahertz production prize for your piece uh, imitation game, a chamber piece, uh, which is a dialogue between a robotics percussionist and a human percussionist based on machine learning last year, 2019. Uh, Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Great to have all of you here. Me, uh, personally, I'm Paolo Dostet. I'm a composer, improviser and researcher into computer-aided creativity and musical interaction in Gothenburg, Sweden. We were supposed to have also composer Alexander Schubert here, who is a professor at Musikhochschule Hamburg. But sadly, he was prevented to join by a, a bike accident on his way to his office to participate in this panel. Uh, he's fine, I've been told, but he needed to see the doctors for a checkup and, and uh, couldn't join. Uh, but Philippe works with him right now, so I expect you to bring in maybe <laughs> Alexander's perspectives too, if you can. Um, uh, so let's get started. I would first like to ask you, um, what got you into the subject of artificial intelligence and or machine learning? And what in it is it that keeps you interested and that, that makes you want to work with this? And maybe we should start with Rebecca. Sure. So uh, my background is both as a computer scientist and uh, originally a classical musician. And I became very interested almost 20 years ago now in how we could use machine learning to understand existing music, especially acoustic music. Um, I did my undergraduate thesis in that area. I did my master's thesis uh, with the Chiro Fujinaga um, in the music information retrieval space. And, and at that point was 
very interested in how machine learning could enable us to deal with large music collections more effectively. Um, but actually, a, a few years after that, during my PhD, I began becoming really interested in questions about how musicians, composers, performers, other creators could use the same kind of tools I saw being used in more data science applications, and how they might use these tools to make new kinds of music and, and you know, engage in their practices more effectively. Interesting. So, uh, Artemi Maria, what about you? Um, so, uh, for me, I guess the main reason I became interested in AI is the different ways in which it's, it challenges us to redefine musicianship. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in human computer co-creativity rather than the simulation of um, human creativity through computational means. So in my practice, I work with interactive music systems that listen to and interact with human musicians and make decisions that can change the course of the performance. So they're not just uh, passively reacting to the musicians. Um, so of course, this kind of scenario begs the question, where is the role of the composer? here, what does the composer do? Because the composer does not um, compose fixed sequences of sounds that will be repeated in every performance. Uh, so that's what interests me, that the object of composition in a way shifts from composing sounds to composing sonic interactions. It's a different understanding of uh, musical authorship and uh, the musical work itself. Thank you. Uh, and Philip, finally. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I'm doing this because it's fun, uh, most of all. And uh, basically, I, I started doing, I did a BSc in mathematics, and then uh, computer science uh, masters. And then I went to do some signal processing and acoustics, and I did lots of stuff. So basically, after a while, I, I started doing genetics. And it bugged me how, how few of the things we can understand actually because of the way we are inherently, like I would say, genetically limited. And uh, this is where I stumbled like 10 years ago upon a paper uh, talking about, uh, you know, intrinsic dimension of manifolds. And for me, it was like a mind blowing experiment where I thought, wow, I can finally work with stuff I don't even understand. So basically, yeah, I'd say it's a weird reason, but yeah, it's thrilling. Thank you. So, well, to think that it's fun, I think is the best reason. <laughs> uh, so, so continue from there. Yesterday we had a, another uh, panel discussion on sort of the history of AI and music and it was titled Good Old Fashioned AI but it became more of a discussion about how to interact with complex systems. And it was it became surprisingly very focused on musicianship uh, and, and, and those aspects of it. And, and now several of you mentions that also. So is it the role of the composer in these kind of spinning on, on what Artemi Maria said just recently, uh, the, com the composer's role in this is, is he or she becoming more of a systems designer and interactor um, than a creator of, of notes now. Anyone? Yeah, uh, I have an idea, but I don't want to interfere right away. Uh, I think this is more a problem of how the tools are designed than the composers themselves, because I think I have a big problem with most of the line of research where you basically look for something which is an infinitely ex nihilo generative machine where you just push a button then you look and you're kind of a passive admirer of what is happening and uh, i think the the new goal would be uh this is something that i've yet to see in the literature but what is the instrumental gesture of uh, ai system what I'm saying is that, you know, every time we invent a new instrument, we also invent new kinds of interactions to go with it. And uh, for me, this is like kind of the big question that I have right now is that we have systems that are able to compress extremely uh, complex information into simpler space, but these space are usually 
16 dimensional, for instance. And the way we interact with it is like a synthesizer. So we have knobs, but it's not, you know, the way you want to interact with something which is so nonlinear. So, sorry, it's a very weird way to start the conversation. Yeah, I have some thoughts to follow on to that. I think, you know, when I when I made the first version of Weckinator 12 years ago now, the, my first paper about it, I describe it as a meta instrument. And I was very influenced, um, not necessarily by the history of machine learning in music or the history of AI or autonomous, you know, random systems in music, but was very influenced by uh, people in the NIME community, people who were building new musical instruments, uh, which, you know, most of which did not have any sort of machine learning or AI, but were nevertheless, you know, thinking in, in very interesting and, and hard to pigeonhole ways about this challenge of you know, what is the role of the composer? And you know, if you're building a new instrument to make new music, then the composer, yes, absolutely, you're a systems designer and absolutely you're thinking about interaction, but you're, you're sort of crafting um, interactive spaces through which you might, you know, you might compose music in that space or you might improvise in that space or some combination of the two. Um, and that really felt, um, you know, that was a goal that I wanted to support to be, you know, for people bringing machine learning into that space as just another tool to help them um, create these kind of systems and do that, comp you know, composing the instrument is a, a term that I really like. Um, and you know, I think looking at things that way, AI can be, you know, one of many tools for composers um, to, to compose spaces for interaction, to compose spaces for possibility, um, and then you know, however they define their role within that, I think is up to them, the individual composer, but also maybe the individual instrument or the piece uh, and so on. And so, you know, when I look at many of the tools that I make, that's actually still now the way that I look at it as, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to build something that facilitates the creation of possibilities, the exploration of possibilities. Um, and when that interaction can feel instrumental in a sense, uh, especially where it can be a, you know, creative exploration of the space and a, a co-creation sometimes between a person and a machine. Um, something that, you know, feels similar to playing an instrument you really love. I, I feel like that's not the only way to see success in that space, but that's that's one um, sign that, that the interaction I've made for creators is successful. So connecting to, uh, before I give the word to Artem and Maria on the same question, you said the musical gesture, Philippe, uh, and how to sort of control AI processes with knobs. But in the NIME community, there are plenty of people who work on, you know, musical control in a higher di number of degrees of freedom, higher number of dimensions that maybe should, you know, maybe those worlds can meet. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's becoming super meta somehow. I mean, you have to build a system to understand the system that is built to understand like music. So basically there is so many, you know, levels. I'm just wondering, I know that there are some research, I've seen some great research on reinforcement learning to try to pilot some uh, exploration process in high dimensional spaces. But uh, I'm wondering if we should, uh, you know, somehow develop an entirely new approach to to co-improvise with these uh, machines because basically it's not you know it's more like um, like jamming with someone I, I know it's weird but I mean it people see it either as an instrument that should be completely estranged to what we're doing or as something which has its own personality and is you know kind of a, another kind of a rep replica of a human being and I'm feeling that this is something in between. And for me, I'm, I'm wondering if the term co-creativity wouldn't be more, uh, you know, astute to resume what's going on with the systems. But I'm speaking as a nerd and I'd love to hear composers. Well, certainly. Yeah, I mean, uh, many, if not all of the people I've worked with would describe their practice as somewhere, you know, in the middle where it's not improvising along with an intelligent agent and it's not simply being in control that we do have this whole whole space in the middle and and... I think people might use different terminology to describe that and might find themselves in different places along that spectrum mm. in different projects. But absolutely, that's, you know, most of the practitioners I know are very comfortably in the mess in that middle of that space. And Artemi Maria, you, I think you even used the word co-creativity or something along those lines in your presentation. 
and you are a practitioner. So, mm -hmm. how do you see this? So, um, I guess there are different ways in which we can conceptualize AI in music making. Um, I mean, we can conceptualize it as a musical instrument, a meta instrument, perhaps. We can conceptualize it as a player, uh, as a virtual musician, or even as an extension of the composer in the case of um, computer assisted composition, perhaps also to narrative systems. But what I wanted to point out is that it's, it's really interesting, uh, not just how musical thinking um, affects the design of these systems, but also how computational affordances um, to a certain degree shape musical thinking. So I find this particularly interesting, this reciprocal um, relation between uh, concepts and tools. So uh, what I find very interesting is that, um, at least in my case, after working with AI, with machine learning algorithms for a while, uh, my approach shifted. And while at first I was using AI to solve some problems, um, currently I'm really looking into specificities of machine learning algorithms and writing pieces inspired by the capabilities and even the limitations of machine learning algorithms. So that's another interesting way in which uh, these tools uh, change the way we make music, the way we compose and perform music. Tools and technologies are essential parts of ideation, is what you're trying to say. So your pieces become about AI also. Exactly. And I think that to some extent, there's this relationship is always reciprocal. Uh, the affordances of the tools we use uh, inevitably uh, influence our ideas and feedback into our ideas. I come to think of uh, Roger Dean and Hazel Smith's term uh, press based or re research led art and art led research or practice led uh, research. It goes both ways, right? And I totally subscribe to that too. So, so that that's a very, you mentioned computational concepts shaping our musical thinking and 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 it goes both ways and that leads us into you know aesthetic implications of these tools tools are really essential in shaping the outcome because we cannot we, we're thinking often in terms of tools we're imagining things in terms of tools and what we've seen others do is also determined and constrained by uh, and enabled by tools and, and now we have these new tools uh, and they they have implications do you have anything uh, any reflections on what those implications might be? They can, of course, be very different depending on where in your process and where in your system, in, uh, improvisation, composition, whatever you apply these technologies, but they certainly have aesthetic implications. Anybody has a reflection on that? Rebecca? Um, sure. So I I think, you know, one of the, one of the really fun uh, avenues for discovery for me over the past uh, decade or so has been, you know, moving from thinking, I would say thinking about machine learning algorithms as a computer scientist to thinking about some of the things that, that Artemis so well, you know, just brought up that thinking about, you know, what are the affordances for especially creative practitioners of, of algorithms, you know, there's a there's a whole bigger question, which I think is just finally starting to get proper attention about the affordances of machine learning algorithms in in general or in other domains. But, you know, one of I, I've learned a lot from the musicians um, and other creative practitioners I've worked with about, yeah, how how the the importance first of all of trying to understand the aesthetic implications of of these new AI or machine learning based tools, but then also discovering, you know, how, how different um, they appear as tools with, you know, specific consequences than what you would assume if you just went and read a machine learning textbook. So one of, I think for me, one of the really important implications is that when you are working with machine learning specifically, you're working with computer systems that can learn from data, right? And that actually is, is hugely powerful in a space like music, because that means that um, we have the potential to communicate um, our, you know, aesthetic ideas um, or preferences 
in a way that can be more natural than communicating with a computer by programming. So if you, you know, program in Super Collider or Max, you know, you're used to thinking about things in a certain way. And you know, those tools also have their own sort of aesthetic affordances. And one of the things that those tools force you to do most of the time is to think in a very, a very structured way, a very sort of modular way. Um, and there are certain things that are very easy to express in that framework, right? Things like you know, mathematical transformations of sequences, for instance, um, or flows between, you know, one object uh, that generates sound and other objects that process sound. Um, but these tools are make it really difficult for us to express things about, you know, how we would like a performer to move, for instance. Um, you know, if I were building something, um, you know, if I were, if I were building a system and with people and had dancers here, the dancers would, you know, describe to other people how they want to move through motions, right? They wouldn't use math and they wouldn't use English or their native language, right? They would provide demonstrations. And so I think one of the most important consequences of using machine learning is that we have the ability to, to learn from, for one thing, demonstrations of how we want to move or sounds that we want to make. And these could be, you know, demonstrations that somebody actually creates on the fly in the, you know, spirit, the sense of you know, what Weckinator enables, for instance, but also you can think of um, other, um, other scenarios where the, the task of a musician might be um, more of curation, right? Finding examples of sounds or finding examples of other content um, that you identify as, you know, speaking to you in some way or that you want to become part of the palette of a piece. And so I think that, you know, this isn't, it's not an aesthetic consequence in, in the sense of like, oh, we're going to build stuff that sounds like X, Y, Z, but it is a consequence in that I think it can enable creators to make systems that respond in more natural ways to um, embodied activities, um, to build systems that actually, you know, can more closely inhabit sound spaces that creators decide are, are something that they want to explore. So those, you know, that's for me the, the number one thing um, that I've ex been excited about. And that's one of the main reasons that I'm still working with machine learning uh, after, you know, 10 years. So basically raising the abstraction level of the input from the composer or the musician by being by example, maybe by language or descriptions uh, and, and instead of, of detailed instructions. Yeah, uh, Philippe, do you want to continue uh, on that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. sorry, I was, I was completely elsewhere because for me it's, it's very, maybe very different, but it's just that as a nerd, uh, there is nothing more depressing than working with composers. And I'm going to explain myself. It's, I, it's a very great experiment because you're building a tool that is based on trying to estimate the distribution of things, right? So it's kind of a good analogy for the whole idea of creativity. If something is too similar, then you're unhappy. Somehow it, it's doing exactly the same thing as what you're doing. And if it's too different and too weird, then you're unhappy as well. You want something in the middle, right? And the first thing that happens every time I work with composers, I gave them some tool. And this tool was actually, you know, they started pressing the wrong buttons. And I would go like, oh, well, what are you doing? No, no, this is not how, how it works. And they would, you know, always you, you have this modeling of a certain uh, part of the space, let's say, and they would automatically go completely outside and trying to look for the model, how to make the model fail. And for me, that has been one of the most creative output that I've seen is always going to the fringe of where the model is failing. So we want to see these things failing. And uh, basically it's kind of everything that I've seen with the use of my tools was the most creative aspect was actually the opposite of what this thing was done for. So. I don't know if it's, I mean, in the history of music, there's been a lot of advances in these failure modes. You know? And uh, so there is always a dissension between how we, we design the tools and we think the tools and then how they are truly used for music. And my guess is this is where the, the fun part comes, you know, when you're doing something to do one thing and then it fails completely and it does something completely different, but it's still super cool. So, 
So what you're saying reminds me about circuit bending, basically, mm. where people take a, a, a toy or a circuit uh, and apply it outside or modify it or apply it in different ways than it was intended for by the designer and in that way really makes it do something different. When During Rebecca's description, I was immediately thinking, okay, you, you describe what kinds of sounds you want to have by providing examples, but then how you, would you get the system to create sounds that you have not heard yet because there are no examples. And maybe what you say is one example of how you could achieve that uh, then. Yeah. If I if I could piggyback on what Philip just said, I mean, certainly, I think one of two of the other really um, useful affordances of machine learning algorithms are number one, that you absolutely can easily get sounds you've never heard, even when you seed it with sounds that you have heard. I mean, that's, you know, that's, again, one of the, the reasons that I think people use Wekinator. And that's one of the discoveries that I had that I, you know, changed the way that I thought about machine learning um, as a creative tool. Um, but also, I think, again, piggybacking on what, what Philip just said, um, one of the affordances of machine learning that I really like is that when you break it, often it's still going to do something that can be creatively interesting, right? And it's so different um, from something like programming in that sense. Like if you if you make a mistake when you're programming, often, you know, if it's text-based language, you're going to get like a compiler error, or if it's, you know, max, maybe you just get silence or you just, you get a filter exploding. If you are working with a, a, an example-based paradigm or, you know, a generation-based paradigm where, you know, something's going to output numbers no matter what, um, often, even if it gives you something that is not what you intended, it can be a starting point for something, you know, really exciting. Hmm. Interesting. And Artemi Maria, What's your take on this? I saw you nodding quite a bit. Yes. Um, so I would say that um, AI algorithms do have aesthetic implications and very important implications, but these implications differ depending on um, how they are applied and that the context of the artistic approach in which they're employed. So in my case, because I use these algorithms in the context of interactive compositions of interactive human computer performance, um, I am interested in specific aesthetic values that the real time listening and decision making of machine learning algorithms uh, allows. So for example, I'm interested in interpretative uh, individuality and multiplicity. So I'm interested in writing uh, compositions that allow diverse interpretations. Uh, my approach also has to do with relational aesthetics. So I do think there is aesthetic value in, in, in the interaction itself, not just the musical outcome, not just the musical product, but the process of interaction, the process of musicking. Um, so how the intentions of different actors are negotiated during the performance, how um, both the human and the machine adapt to each other's uh, actions and decisions in real time. And then there are other um, aesthetic values. So for example, ephemerality, the fact that uh, a performance can never be repeated to performances of an interactive work can never be uh, identical. Um, so, but this is just one example of the aesthetics that AI uh, enables. And I'm sure that if these algorithms are used in a different uh, context, uh, they will prioritize different uh, values. There was uh, yesterday a uh, mentioning of the role of indeterminacy and the interactive indeterminacy. And I see that theme also in what you are all describing, that, that they will give you interesting results, but they cannot really be predicted, or they, they, they don't give you the results that you get with other uh, techniques. So this this leads me to uh, a related question. And there are a certain generation of AI or machine learning users that write their own algorithms from scratch and, and you know, code everything, etc. And then there's the next level where you apply already ready-made libraries, etc. And some use even packages, program packages, but but uh, and start to use it on a higher level. Is there, if you look at these sort of end users being composers or musicians or whatever, that are not developing new algorithms, that don't have the research um, perspective as some of us have, uh, is there a craft to be learned uh, of 
being a machine learning or AI uh, musician composer and, and how to figure out how to sort of tweak them into newness, novelty, unexpected results in spite of them being data example based, etc. Is there is there such a craft? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sorry, I'm just answering. <laughs> oh, go ahead, please elaborate. <laughs> I think the answer is plainly yes. Somehow, maybe it's even one of the big issues. I mean, there is some, you know, sometimes it feels like cooking and it's kind of weird because, um, I mean, there are some principled approaches and you could, you know, of course, there has been some developments. For instance, I don't know if, you, if you've heard about the bottleneck information theory and there are some exciting developments into explaining fundamental properties behind uh behind the workings i mean the inner workings of such algorithms and so this is like kind of thrilling area of research but even as a researcher sometimes you know when i i got a new phd three months ago and she started working on just a problem of rhythm generation and you know she did the model almost perfectly well and it was all good and she's a scientist i mean she's done five years of mathematics and she knows everything she, she needs to know about the math behind the thing. And when I looked at her code, I said, oh yeah, so you have to put this between zero and one for the first 100 epochs. And then you have to be careful that this is at the same level as this. And it really just sounded like, you know, I was just giving a recipe. And the same applies, I guess, to the use of the, the development itself is already knowing a lot of, you know, little tricks. So I'm wondering for the, the user level, as you said, it's interesting because I've seen uh, so many more composers in the recent years, they just come and they already know how, know how to, to do their own recipe. Somehow they come and they usually, you know, git clone something and they kind of pipeline it to another git clone. And then it's a lot of pre-made solutions. And I guess this is kind of normal for at one point, maybe we're going to have a package installer for machine learning. And it's also the, the kind of directions you see for the auto ML type of research where you're going to have like pre-made solutions. So I don't think there has been an auto email for creative stuff. I hope it will never happen, but I'm pretty sure someone one day will have a sick mind and think about doing auto creative ML something. Uh, the, the reason I, before I, the other word to the others is uh, I pose this question is that of course if you take a ready-made tool that has some kind of high-level implications there is a risk for some conformistic uh, effects in the output that uh, that the tool could generate similar things for the next user if you just take it as it is but on the other hand uh, uh, a programmer user we only have 24 hours per day but uh, and and uh, if you start developing your stuff, maybe you don't have so as much time as a person who starts using them on a high level could actually develop a, a craft by actually using it and using it and using it and find tweaks on a higher abstraction level. Um, uh, I think I, Maria or Rebecca want to continue uh, on this? Yeah, if I may just jump in on that, I think that really depends on the design of the tools. So it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, there are tools and Wikinator is one of these that allows users to make their own mappings and use their the tool in their own creative even subversive way if they wish to uh, then there are black box approaches and i have to say i have uh, i find these approaches kind of problematic because they lack interactive capabilities you do not really know what's happening inside the black box you probably just have an input and an output and those are clearly very problematic uh, to work with uh, now, I think that uh, machine learning tools are becoming increasingly available. And I think that's very important because this technology is becoming uh, accessible to artists. And I think that tools and particularly um, uh, open source tools have really helped in that. And then all the online courses, the introductory machine learning courses designed specifically for artists and uh, musicians. Um, I am one of the people that programs your own 
neural networks. And the reason I do that is because I want to get a deeper understanding of the algorithms I'm working with. Uh, having said that, I don't think that it's necessary to program your own neural networks in Python in order to do interesting music with neural networks. Uh, but for me, this has been a way of uh, getting to know these algorithms better and understand their inner workings and particularly their limitations, which uh, is something that uh, I'm very interested in. Thank you. Rebecca, you want to continue from there? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I have done a little bit of research in this area over the last few years, because when I when I started teaching my first class about uh, machine learning for musicians and artists, I really, you know, realized that, you know, similar to what Philip said, you know, there's there's a lot of sort of, you know, intuition that you gain after working with machine learning for a while. And it's not necessarily the stuff that's there in textbooks or even in, you know, today in online tutorials. And I had a lot of that intuition, which wasn't stuff that I was taught, you know, as a computer science student you, learning about machine learning. But then also, you know, the, the composers and artists that I'd been working with had their own sort of, you know, burgeoning set of intuition and techniques that were totally separate. Um, and, you know, I think if somebody's going to use uh, machine learning in their work and it's anything that's, you know, has any degree of interactivity at all. And, and in this, I include, I think, you know, choosing the training data that somebody, something is trained on, which is often the, the biggest way to have an impact on the result is to tweak that rather than some parameter of your, your neural net. You know, even in that case, it's going to be very helpful for people to have a certain core set of knowledge about, you know, what does it mean to train an algorithm? What does it mean to choose the representation or the features that you give as an input into a neural net, for instance? You know, what are the sorts of tweaks that you might do either to the data or to the algorithm when it doesn't do what you want the first time? And so there's absolutely some some knowledge um, that's, you know, is is related to, but not the same as fundamental machine learning knowledge that you would take, you know, get from a computer science course. But I would actually, you know, go further than, than what's been said uh, already by Philip in that it, I think there's also really distinctive knowledge that is useful for creators. Um, and, you know, for instance, there are a lot of things that you would learn in a computer science context about rules that you shouldn't break, right? People talk about overfitting to your training data, for instance, that you you don't want your training set to be too small and you don't want to, you know, have your training accuracy too high because that means that your model won't generalize. Well, that's, that's a great rule if you're trying to build a model that does, you know, stock market prediction or medical diagnosis. It can be a great rule in all sorts of music systems, but it's also a really bad rule in a bunch of other music systems. Um, and that, you know, that goes for whether you're doing Wekinator style supervised learning or, you know, generative machine learning. I think, you know, it's, there is a separate set of knowledge that's beginning to be formed within the creative community about, you know, what are the rules that we can break? What are the rules that maybe we should in general be breaking if, for instance, we're building something that's just you know, just for me to use in a particular piece, um, or something that I want to be able to control easily with a small amount of training data. I don't want to spend, you know, two weeks training my algorithm. I want to spend a smaller amount of time training. Suddenly, we're in a very, you know, different computational space than a lot of other uh, machine learning work. So I, you know, I find that space very interesting. It's it's not something people have been talking about uh, a whole lot yet. And I, I connect directly to what you just said to what Philip said about composers wanting him to go or wanting to go outside of his the tools that he pr presented to them and abusing the algorithms or, you know, abusing unless you're into stock market synthesis, which might be an interesting yes. area. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally see what you mean. So may I just, while we're at uh, talking to you, Rebecca, since you did this, big online course is it's is it done and finished and or is it it's still, it's still going um people can still sign up for the cadenze uh, machine learning for musicians and artists course and that's a very you know introductory level course that's focused on 
you know, on one hand, teaching people to use Wekinator as a tool for their own creative work, but also using Wekinator and related tools to, to give people hands-on practice with these algorithms from the perspective of saying, you know, how might you use these uh, in music and art? And we have, um, through my, uni my new university, UAL, we've got a, a similar but short course now on future learn where people can again get a really you know uh, in accessible introduction to machine learning that's that's targeting people from creative backgrounds um, there are absolutely other courses that my my colleagues have made for people who want to go deeper so it's again i think it's an expanding uh, space so what was the uh, what when you conceived of these courses what was the hardest thing to sort of make accessible or to communicate and are there any interesting unexpected outcomes Yeah I mean I think the 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 difficulty was around what I just mentioned in thinking about you know what is it really at the end of the day that creative people should learn about machine learning if they're going to be able to use the tools that are out there um, not necessarily program new tools from scratch, but also if they're going to be able to reason effectively about the space of what machine learning could do in a variety of creative work, rather than just you know repeating the examples that that I show them. Um, and you know, in terms of of surprises, I mean, I'm continually surprised at where my students take machine learning knowledge and and what people actually can do without a, you know a whole you know, computer science background without a whole you know mathematical background that you would generally assume someone would have in in going to study machine learning in a computer science uh, venue so i think uh, you know and and based on the kinds of projects that people make i'm always thinking oh yeah maybe you know there's this other tiny branch of machine learning or signal processing, especially that it'd be really handy if they knew that they could even take this further. So it's, you know, there's certainly always, uh, you know, the case that more technical knowledge could be more useful, but yeah, I'm, I'm just continually impressed with, with where people take um, these, these first nuggets of ideas and, and do something I would never have thought of. Wonderful. And yeah. now we're talking, yeah. Sorry, I'd like to <laughs> to kind of respond to that because uh, there's lots of interesting things in what uh, Rebecca said. And it just in, reminds me of a, a weird book I stumbled upon a, a long time ago, which I found super weird. It's called uh, Learning How to Disobey. And for me, this title is a fallacy somehow. How can you, by following the rules that you're taught how to not follow the rules, Somehow, implicitly, you are following rules. It's very basic thinking, but somehow, in the machine learning sense, you know, for me, the the biggest point. I mean, I don't see people as machine learning uh, algorithm, although it sounded like this. But uh, you know, in these algorithms, one thing that I I always find uh, distressing is that we are computing expectations, right? So we are kind of modeling mean errors. So in the creative sense, for me, it's kind of a pity because somehow it's always these uh, outsider outliers points that might uh, contain most of the creative values. And same goes for the pedagogy. You want to, you know, you want to make something which is applicable to anyone. And I'm wondering if there is, I mean, I'm just following up on this pedagogy problem is that you, you also train your students as you would train machine learning algorithm. You want them to make like the minimum mean error and you don't want them to be uh, you know, outliers. But um, yeah, for me, the question there for the creative use is uh, maybe also there has been a lot of, uh, you know, the algorithms that we use are based on something which is more pragmatic. And uh, I don't know if you guys like noise music, for instance. Sure. I love noise music. I mean, I'm a huge fan of noise music. And I try to do a neural network to try to, you know, model noise music and make noise music. And then it played like white noise. And I thought, okay, is does that make sense or not? Because somehow, you know, you're, you're kind of modeling noise. So how could we generate these kinds of things. So I don't know if I make a lot of sense right now, but... Uh... It makes some sense for sure. Uh, <laughs> I want to, uh, to continue over to Artemi Maria because I think I've heard from you that you have been using Wakinator 
and 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 maybe the other aspect of of uh, learning these things how did you appropriate you and now you code your own neural nets etc how did you learn these technologies how did you sort of get into them and appropriate them as your your main tools um so actually i came across uh, uh wakinator after i had started programming my own neural networks but it was really a very interesting discovery for me. And I do use Wakinator in the in an introductory course uh, that I teach uh, at the IEM here in Graz. Um, so, sorry, could you repeat the question, I think? How did you <laughs> learn these things? How did you get into it and learn to appropriate them as well as you have uh, as your mm -hmm. main tools? Um, so I learned the usual way, online courses, online machine learning courses, all the introductory courses. Um, I could get my hands on some courses at the Technical University here in Graz. And I was really curious. I wanted to see, I, I knew that there was something in there for me. I, I always thought it's, it's really interesting to be able to train computers by examples. Um, so I just I just learned machine learning first, and then I um, discovered I th or thought about ways to uh, apply machine learning in my music. So of course, the first applications that I could come up with um, were very straightforward. I used neural networks for uh, machine listening mainly, for example, playing technique recognition instrument recognition, a combination of the two. Uh, then as I was using machine learning algorithms more and more, I, I think uh, this, this goes back to what Rebecca said earlier, that you really learn machine learning when you start applying it. And then you realize what this is all about. So training can be really frustrating depending on the task, depending on the machine learning task at hand. And you will always run into problems with overfitting. The machine learning algorithms will always make some arbitrary assumptions about your data and you will try to solve this problem. Uh, well, recently what I've been trying to do is actually uh, exploit the problem artistically. Um, so after I had all these issues with the arbitrary assumptions, uh, I thought that's actually uh, a very interesting topic for a piece. Uh, so another, for me, an important discrepancy between machine learning algorithms and composition and artistic practices in general is that Machine learning tasks are closed-ended tasks. At least supervised learning algorithms deal with closed-ended tasks. And creative processes, on the other hand, are open-ended processes. It's a process of discovery. There is no right and wrong. There is no accuracy. It's just exploration and discovery. Uh, so in the piece that I've, uh, I've been recently working on, I am exploring uh, machine learning bias and aesthetic judgments. So what I did in this piece is that I collected a lot of um, excerpts from uh, improvisations and rated these excerpts based on my subjective aesthetic preferences. Uh, and then I trained a neural network to predict how it would evaluate new sounds and new uh, excerpts of improvisations. And this neural network during the performance determines whether the computer will respond to the musician's input, remain silent, or propose new sound material. But what I did in this space is not really um, simulate my own aesthetic preferences. I wasn't interested in simulating my preferences as accurately as possible. I was interested in the bias that the machine learning algorithm would develop, in the arbitrary assumptions that it would make about my own aesthetic preferences. So I use this bias uh, to give the algorithm or to allow the algorithm to develop its own aesthetic agency. So yeah, again, I'm coming back to my, to my work, but yeah, it's because it's very hard to generalize or extrapolate from my work to the work of others. Oh, we want to hear about your work, so that's perfectly fine. I see Rebecca nodding, and and it looks like you have something follow up from this because it's close. No, to I just I'm just enjoying hearing some of the details about how Artemi Maria is is thinking about the work that she's doing, and and you know, it's I always just find it so fun to get that perspective of someone who's so deeply in it and and thinking about these on a daily basis. So thank you. So Artemi Maria, what what did come out of these? you wanted to exploit the biases and sort of assumptions of the algorithm. Uh, what, what happened? 
It was actually very interesting. The algorithm was able to make some very, um, very convincing assumptions about my preferences, but it tended to take these to the extremes. So I do have a preference for low frequency and drone-like sounds, but the uh, algorithm really uh, took that to the extremes. But what was interesting about this piece is that working with this um, approach um, opened up new creative possibilities for me. So uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, after I trained this neural network to develop its own aesthetic bias, its only aesthetic preferences, I decided that I'm not going to compose the electronic sounds for this piece. So uh, the agent has its own aesthetics, its own aesthetic preferences. So what it does is that it collects sounds in its interactions with human musicians. So it has a continuously expanding sound database. So none of the electronic sounds that are heard in the piece were uh, composed or designed by me. And uh, yeah, this is something that, this is a possibility that was opened up to me because of machine learning, because of this approach. And yeah, it, it really is a different approach to authorship. It is sort of uh, a meta-compositional approach where I'm not really designing the sounds that will be heard in the piece and just designing the agencies that will um, collect, modify, and uh, recombine those sounds. That's certainly something I can relate to. When I was a student, I did a string orchestra piece based on a recursive algorithm and the material completely sounded like it was written by somebody else and but i've written every line of code and i in the end i actually called the piece creature because it felt like it was composed by somebody else and then it led me to develop some kind of philosophy about how to relate to that so i i can certainly uh, yeah but there was one interesting thing in what you said that it will reinforce your biases you like bass so it will like bass even more sort of a simplification and we all heard about the sort of radicalist tendencies of YouTube's recommender systems. Uh, I haven't heard the same thing about Spotify's musical recommender systems. Maybe it's less extreme, but if you start, if you just listen to one right wing clip and they will just recommend more and more. And in the end, you're listening to completely r ridiculous, extreme examples. Is this something uh, is, is this something that you've seen happen in musical applications? Uh, now we heard from Artima Maria, what about Rebecca and Philip? And is this something that other composers have or you have uh, exploited or stumbled upon? I mean, I, I don't have a, a long answer to that. I think, you know, the the tendencies for recommender systems like YouTube to, to pull you toward extreme content have so much to do with the fact that that's, you know, that's part of the reward mechanism within those algorithms, right? If, if you reward it, you know, it's not being rewarded for suggesting extreme content, it's being rewarded based on, you know, how many times you keep watching the next video and how long your eyeballs are on the screen. And I think, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, at at the very least, I think it's useful to expose as, you know, that's that's just a computational mechanism that's at, you know, that's available to composers who want to use these kinds of algorithms. And, you know, in the, the most boring case, that can just be something that, you know, ends up living inside of a, a system that, you know, becomes interesting for you to negotiate with. Um, I think in more interesting cases, it can become, you know, something that people engage with as part of the concept of a work. Um, I'm, you know, I've done some work with uh, with artists in the, especially in London and a few other communities around the UK the last few years, thinking about how we can use creative um, contexts of machine learning to actually engage people in learning more about the machine learning systems around them that are influencing them and, you know, are, everybody in the world at this point, you know, I th I'm interested personally in how, um, you know, something like art or music can, can help us to demystify the inner workings of these algorithms. And I think it, it can be helpful to expose them as something, you know, algorithms themselves, you know, it's, they don't, again, they don't prefer one kind of content or another, but they're a complex set of, of ways that you could build an algorithm that, that ends up 
that way. And I think it's useful for people to be able to reason about, you know, why does that happen in the real world? And maybe that's because they want to go build a piece that takes advantage of that somehow, or maybe it's just because they want to grapple more effectively with these questions about like, why do certain, you know, social media companies and YouTube have so much money? Um, how do they have so much influence over people? What should we do about them? Should we regulate them? Should we, you know, what should we do? Um, so I, you know, I, I look at it more in terms of, um, the opportunities there rather than saying, oh, this is something we, we literally need to be worried about in the same way in, in artistic contexts. So uh, art and especially music could be a sort of a, a, an experimental sandbox to increase the uh, general understanding of these kinds of systems uh, to understand the implications in society where they're applied to more sort of dangerous content. That's I right, have a, hopefully. Uh, so that's how I understood what you said. So uh, a side question, could this simplification or acceleration that Artemi Maria described in her case, the bias that came out and that we see in YouTube, could it also be explained in terms of that these models that are trained are so much simpler than you know the models that we have in here so that they accelerate things or is that a misunderstanding? That's a good question. I mean, it, it comes back to your definition of, of simple. Um, and um, I think smaller networks, fewer nodes, uh, you know, less complexity, that kind of simplicity. Sure, sure. And, you know, honestly, when I when I work with students to try the try to help them um, understand the issues around, uh, you know, bias that are making the headlines at the moment, especially, you know, around, say, um, text generation systems like GPT-3, right? There's been a lot of attention around this um, recently. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily talk about the simplicity as being a shortcoming or the thing that leads to bias. I actually think that it's, you know, it's a combination of, of having enough complexity that we're inclined to trust them or that we can imagine ways that we would rely on them. Um, and also enough opaqueness and, and sort of alienness to the ways that we think of you know, things as people that we're not necessarily able to anticipate the kinds of errors that we're going, that they're going to make. We don't necessarily have, you know, well-established ways of evaluating systems before we put them out into the world. Um, and it's very easy for people who, you know, maybe are, are, have technical credentials or or are well placed in certain companies to to sell an idea that oh this is actually intelligent or this is actually you know sort of some kind of magical thing and it's too complicated for you to understand so i i think all of those are the the issues that i tend to talk about with my students and again i think by unpacking those we we end up with a very similar set of tools both for helping people to engage with with larger ethical and technological questions more effectively, but also enabling people to potentially work more effectively as artists with the same kinds of tools to, you know, to use them in their own ways or to make art about or engaging with these these kinds of um, issues. Thank you. Uh, so before giving the word to Philip on the on the, if you have further developments of this, I will weave in a question from the audience that came in through to Telegram on this topic. And it goes like this, how much do you have to know or understand about the algorithm behind your work? And is it enough to be aesthetically interesting to work with machine learning strategies? Also referring to the political dimension of AI. So it connects nicely to what we just talked about. Philip. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to answer because there has been like 10 different questions floating around. So first I'd like to to go back on the question of simplicity, because you're kind of asking how many parameters are there in the brain? And uh, it reminds me of a great book by von Neumann, which is called The Computer and the Brain. And it's a great experiment because it tried to project the computer operation on the brain functions based on its biological features, like the fact that actual neurons have, you know, this kind of drawback period where they can't compute anymore. And it showed that basic mathematical operations done by a computer were completely inaccessible to the brain. So the level of complexity also depends on how you evaluate the task somehow. Uh, now, going back 
to how this plays out in creative settings. I guess I already said my big concern and I'm going to talk about it again a little bit because it chimes quite well with what uh, Rebecca just said, which is, uh, you know, for me, the, the theory of the outliers. I mean, the question of how do we model based on data something which is outside and is usually unaccounted for. And uh, for me, this also chimes well with, you know, you talked about recommender system and I, I'm thinking you, you maybe know about the cold start problem or the long tail problem, which means, for instance, if you have a recommender system, it's usually built on a very simple idea. You're going to like what other people like, which is kind of stupid somehow, but somehow, yeah. I mean, if you like nine out of 10 bands from as someone else, then you should listen to the 10 band, right? Because you have such similarities in your taste that it means you should behave together as a likeness function, I'd say. But um, yeah, for me, it's not, it's not problematic somehow because, you know, if you don't have machine learning, this is already something that is happening in the music industry. I mean, having, you know, mass processed music is a problem that predates the machine learning somehow. And my guess is that I don't think machine learning now because it's dubbed intelligent should be held accountable for being the responsible for, uh, you know, this kind of mildness in the music industry. So uh, pertaining to the last question, I'm sorry, I'm trying to unfold everything at the same time. But uh, yeah, my guess is more on how we, we use. So the question of how much do you need to know what's going on? I mean, has anyone ever unmounted MS-20 to look at the circuit inside and yet wasn't able to play with this magnificent synthesizer? I'm taking the MS-20, but it could be any synthesizer, right? Most of Talking the- about the Korg MS-20 semi-modular yeah, absolutely. I own one. And I'm very, very proud of it. And I love it. And I have no idea what's going on inside. I mean, most of the time, I'm just tweaking buttons and saying, oh, that sounds nice. And oh, this sounds nice. So basically, yeah, creative use of something is mostly, I don't know, maybe it's my weird view on this, but mostly trial and error processes have been defined uh, for what's been going on. I mean, some of the big advances in the musical world were errors, like machines falling for the, you know, distortion in the TB303, which led to acid techno, this type of, uh, you know, weird things that happened, and that still led to great improvements and complete different genres in music. So regarding machine learning, my guess is more on how people will use the algorithms because uh, if you look at mass produced music from machine learning, this will be, of course, a problem. But if you go and look at what composers are doing with these software, usually they, they tend to, to go to these uh, crazy uh, thing. And lately I've seen lots of, uh, you know, active learning uh, research in ACAM. So active learning is basically the idea of, you know, the output of the network is gonna feed back into a new network. So you have this kind of loop in creation that can be generated. So for me, this is a very exciting avenue where basically you can kind of push back all the time. And this is something I've seen with the composers that are, for instance, I'm just going to finish with an anecdote. It's always nicely, nice taste somehow. So the first uh, musical piece I worked with was with uh, Daniele Ghisi. And it was uh, maybe six years ago, or I don't remember. It was quite some time ago. And we started working on this uh, generative uh, waveform generative uh, machine. And uh, it was for a reboot of Frankenstein. And uh, he wasn't interested at all by something that would just produce uh, the end music, but more by the sonification of gradient descent somehow. You know, so he started from something which sounded like white noise and complete mess. And then he would iteratively listen to what's going on in the learning process. So even though you, you have no idea what's going on inside the machine, which is the case, I mean, few instrumentalists know what is the acoustic of the harmony table of uh, their violin, for instance. I mean, does that preclude you from creating something great with a violin? I don't think so. 
So maybe it's because, you know, there is this hype about intelligence and we need to know what's going on. But in the end, for creative purposes, I mean, I don't think that it's any barrier to, to use this type of approaches, even though you don't really know what's going on inside. To, to summarize, basically, your Korg MS-20, you don't understand the dance of the electrons in the circuit. You're happy with the patch cable and parameter level when you create music and trial and error. And the listener is maybe happy with an, yet another higher abstraction level, which is how, how your music sounds. Uh, and, and another thing I sort of extracted of from what all of you said is is that maybe instead of applying machine learning to creative artistic tasks, we creatively apply machine learning to artistic tasks that sort of we apply them in new ways. Um, so j just one small anecdote on, on this recommender systems. I, I, I'm not an expert in that topic, but I heard a presentation by a researcher at Spotify once and the most interesting model that he described was one that was based on your aesthetic enemies. So aesthetic enemy would be one who had the, the most distant taste of, of yourself. So and the, the music that that person dislikes the most, maybe you would like. So it sort of bounces to the other side of the space and back again. And that turned out to be a quite an interesting algorithm. I thought that was a wonderful concept and I, I haven't seen research on how well it worked but I think that was an interesting way of getting out of just you know the closest friends kind of algorithm so I want to jump over to we talked about accessibility of machine learning learning teaching uh, and also the accessibility in terms of open source etc and there's another accessibility uh, thing related to interactivity and in real time because we all know that deep learning systems and <coughs> huge neural nets, they, they require huge computational resources, uh, even to the scale of being an environmental issue. But, but when do you think to make machine learning more accessible in interactive and real-time applications, can we make much smaller, do we need, or does it suffice with much smaller systems that learn on the fly that r demands much smaller uh, processors and uh, they really can scale down in complexity because they are part of an interactive network with a human or or do we really want to wait or do we have to wait for when big computation goes small and portable and, and real time you see what i mean i i can say a few words about that i think you know, I think the answer really depends on on what type of machine learning we're talking about and and especially how people want to use machine learning in their work. So I think, you know, if if we're thinking about, you know, the sort of caricature of music generation systems that I think, you know, none of the three of us are particularly excited about or focused on. None of you the know, three of us. Yeah. They're, you know, if you really want something that's going to, you know, generate convincing top 40 pop music, um, then sure, actually having having a really sophisticated algorithm like the kind that we see in, in OpenAI's jukebox, for instance, trained on lots and lots of data, you know, millions of songs um, that's going to take, you know, I think it's, I think they, they take nine hours to generate one minute of audio and a lot of that audio is actually, you know, pretty convincing in the narrow domains where they're they're using this. If you want to generate a new Frank Sinatra song, it can generate, spend that nine hours and generate you a minute of something that sounds like it's Frank Sinatra singing. You know, yeah, that's that's a problem that in that that's not accessible to the average artist to play around with. I have a, a postdoc working with Jukebox right now and just trying to explore what its creative affordances are. And he's got to be working on the, the supercomputer grid in, you know, in Canada in order to just get any sort of understanding of what might be possible and interesting for him as a musician. That mm -hmm. said, you know, again, the, the closest analogs I think to, to draw on would be the work in um, generative language models, where a lot of these models allow you to do a, a fairly computationally cheap fine-tuning step with your own data to, to 
you know, just take something that's been trained and tweak it a little bit with, you know, low cost, low computational resources to do something that's more personalized, or even doing some of the, the few shot or zero shot learning that people have been doing with GPT-3, where you could say, I'm not even going to retrain it, I'm going to give it, you know, the equivalent of like a few notes of a melody, and then see what it does to complete that. I think that's, you know, that's, a lot of the future of what the people are thinking about and how to make these giant, very computationally intensive models more accessible. But that said, you know, is that interesting? Is that the, the interesting space to be in? I'm not totally convinced. I think there's so many other things um, that allow people much more creative agency over defining what the role of machine learning should be. And for many of those, you know, thinking about how we can use the kinds of, you know, the scale of data sets and the scale of, you know, computational power that might be available to an average, you know, academic research lab or an average independent composer, you know, there's, there's still a lot there and there's a lot left to be explored there. Um, and then there's a whole middle ground of people doing, you know, doing generative work where, yeah, you, you do want probably bigger data sets, or you want at least to, to have a fair amount of computation at your disposal in order to, you know, get the most out of the data that you have. And there, I think in the next few years, absolutely, that space is going to be um, to benefit from the research people are doing around making um, training more complex deep learning models more efficient, uh, deploying models that can be run in real time more efficiently, and so on. So that's that's my take on things at the moment. To rephrase the question a little bit, will simpler systems that can run in real time on affordable hardware, whatever, uh, give us, you know, the same kind of compl complexity just because they are part of an interactive situation with a musician instead of being these autonomous generative systems? That was. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd hesitate to use the, the the phrase the same kind of complexity because it again it means it, it depends on what you mean by complexity. Yeah, but course. are these you know systems that are going to be equally or more musically compelling and useful to people? Absolutely, I think so. Thank you. I'd like to. I I really love this debate. Sorry, so I'm kind of barging in right away. But um, I think what machine learning is missing most now is Kolmogorov complexity. What I mean by Kolmogorov complexity, if you don't know it, it's the complexity of the minimal algorithm which is required to generate a sequence. So basically, you know, we evaluate the accuracy and what Rebecca has nicely put about GPT-3 and, you know, one of the most depressing article I've ever read was actually the GPT-3 article and because they really state out that they didn't do anything research-wise they just took GPT-2 and they multiplied the number of parameters by 100 and it's written. And they even have like this ecological argument like, yeah, we know it's kind of plain, but yeah, we, we know it's very heavy. And you see the same thing in images. For instance, the paper called Big GAN is also kind of depressing. You know, it's, uh, it's a progressive growing of GANs multiplied by 100. So my guess is how can you term dub something intelligent when it's another paper by Bengio, which shows that some of the models actually have more parameters than the points in the data set. So you can actually memorize the entire data set in your model. So for me, this, this question of model, I don't know if we can call it complexity, but at least there is some trade-off. There is always some beauty in simplicity, right? Which is Occam's razor. And it's of course something we, we really need to, to address, not only in the creative sense, but in, in, on an intellectual level. You know, there was this debate between Piaget and Chomsky, and ultimately the question between traditional AI and deep learning and neural networks stem down to this idea, which is, do we have some universal grammar and some structure which has pre-made in the brain, or should we learn everything from scratch? And my guess is that actually real intelligent solution and even creative solution will come from simpler algorithms that don't really necessitate, you know, hundreds of hours of data set and billions of parameters. So for me, this is like really a flow in current deep learning research to try to always put the accuracy as this kind of ultimate score of what's going on. And basically, taking into account the number of parameters, the, the, 
let's say energy uh, efficiency of your model and this type of things is usually not as well uh, well seen in the community. So basically you don't really get uh, famous research if you just say, oh, I did the same thing as this old paper, but with twice as less parameters. But in the creative sense, it's really important, I guess. We, we recently worked with this, uh, this thing called the lottery ticket hypothesis. And for me, this is like brilliant. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's just magnificent. It's um, the idea that inside big uh, overparameterized network, because you know, right now there's like two regimes where you have like a few parameters. And when you go to the overparameterized um, kind of area of learning, then you get even less errors. So basically this theory says that inside these big networks, there are super efficient sub networks that can be found, but only if you first train the overparameterized network and you can reduce. And this is something we tried with the generative music. So we published two papers recently, which is uh, we can do the same thing as a wave net, which used to, to be like uh, in the order of multiple gigabytes and we can remove 99% of the weights and still do the same thing. So right now there is no you know, ground truth theory, but my guess is that we are starting to, to get to a point where things are learning because they have so many degrees of freedom, then they can go everywhere. And in the end, I hope that there will be this kind of uh, backtracking effect where we find out that inside this super complex solution, there is actually a very light uh, explainable solution that can be used and used across problems. Is this connected to that, the fact that we don't really know how the neurons in the brain do connect and that's why we have these big arrays of sort of universal connectivity and then when you've done this large scale training then you can prune it because you find a structure that sort of works but you have to do that big thing first. Uh, is that sort of a detour into that problem? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's quite, um, you can easily understand, I think you, you nailed it right <laughs> on the spot. So uh, just as a picture, if you imagine that you only have two dimensions and there is a hill and there is a big mountain in front of you, the more you add dimensions, the more there is a chance that you can actually detour around the mountain. So in 3D, you are most likely to find a path where you can actually circle around and find a better point of optimization. So that's the whole thing about overparameterization is that, um, I mean, you all know the universal approximation theorem, which means that supposedly we only need three layers to solve any problem with a neural network. The problem is that, can we find it? Can we train something to find the solution? So my guess is right now we are only doing overparameterized things because we don't really know how to get to this point, but I'm surely hoping that we won't uh, like, you know, train something that requires the energy of the whole country for a year just to get one picture of dog somehow, I hope. <laughs> so, so now, uh, Artemi Maria, uh, on this topic of, of simplicity and we could manage with simpler systems, uh, what's your take on that? Um, I think I would like to shift the focus of the conversation a little bit because I think that complexity might not be the number one accessibility issue we're uh, facing right now, at least in music AI. Um, so I think that for me, if I offer my perspective as an artist, uh, the main question and the main um, discrepancy between the design of AI tools and their use in artistic contexts um, or the main issue are the embedded music theoretical and aesthetic assumptions in the software. So for example, there is um, software that operates on a note level. So that software assumes that musical notes play a role in music. And that is true for a lot of music, but not for all of it. So this kind of approach, for example, would leave out any sound based music. So I think that is that is an important challenge in music AI. And it just shows that uh, music AI would really benefit from closer collaboration between uh, computer scientists and musicians, practitioners. So I, I think there are a lot of questions relating specifically to music applications of AI that don't have to do with 
complexity, uh, but yet make these tools uh, less accessible to artists. So there are a lot of things that we, we need to, to question. For example, is style imitation really a, a, rele a relevant objective for music AI applications? There are a lot of style imitation systems out there. I've spoken to a lot of artists that work with music AI, and I think none of them are interested in uh, producing outputs that are similar to what they would have composed. I think artists are more interested in systems that generate surprising or unlikely um, outputs. So I think that we really need to focus more on the why rather than on the how. So instead of the numbers of parameters, we really need to question the underlying assumptions, the aesthetic assumptions, music theoretical assumptions behind the design of that software. So to uh, extract from what you said, uh, one, one thing is that basically technology is way ahead, but we still haven't figured out how to use it and, and, and what for, in a sense. Exactly. And also your other main point is that of representation. My, my background is not into neural nets, but evolutionary computation. Uh, and there, the rep representation of the objects that you evolve is absolutely crucial because they define the space that can be explored. And it's, it's of course, the same uh, when working with uh, neural nets. Uh, so, so do you have anything to add to, to that, to this very important issue of the choice of representation, the design of representations? any of you yeah actually i'm um, you know i don't understand uh, why the variational and flow based approach are are so not uh, not so much uh, hyped compared to gans because for me the the real power comes exactly as you said by the incremental transformation of representations the problem I see with that is that it's still this fundamental incoherency between what we want and what we have. You know, sometimes we kind of want, uh, I don't know if you've worked in the field of disentanglement, for instance, it's been a big kind of hype at the moment where you try to find a model which is able to separate, um, you know, your, the factors of variations uh, inside your data set. But then at one point you, you hit this kind of intellectual limit where the actual dimensions that should be separated, I don't think we can really process how uh, these information should be separated. So my big issue right now is at what level the representations can be understood, humanly understood, and how can we define interaction in these spaces? So yeah, my guess is that uh, of course, we want to compress the space uh, to a limit where everything makes sense, but that's kind of removing the beauty of creative exploration, right? You were talking about surprising or exciting type of, uh, of models, and that's always the problem. I mean, we have to find a kind of trade-off between how much we understand what's going on in the model and how much it's going to surprise us. Artemi Maria? you have any response to that? Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add to that. Uh, it's, it's certainly a trade-off. And I think it's also a question of interaction design. So for example, off the top of my head, it could be up to the user to decide uh, the extent of surprise, or it's it's really a question of design. But what I wanted to point out before is that uh, when you design tools for artistic use, for creative uh, use, all the, all the design decisions are uh, inherently aesthetic decisions. So that's what I, I wanted to point out, that we need to perceive them as such. Yeah, I think that's, that's such an important point. Uh, and again, you know, almost all the tools out there to do any kind of machine learning it's not even that they were designed you know by one person to do music a certain way it's that they were designed by people who might you know not know anything about music music is not the target use case for these algorithms um, and the tools that are out there are you know and the tu accompanying tutorials the abstractions that are present in the apis any sort of demos that you can find that apply them to music they're you know, such 
in many, most cases, I think a mismatch to the kinds of exploration and thinking and learning that we would ideally be facilitating musicians, composers, other, other creators in doing. And, you know, I, I, from my own perspective, you know, when I started my PhD work in 2006 or whatever, I thought I was going to be developing new algorithms for composers to use machine learning in real time to do things like real time score following or real time um, gesture recognition. And I spent like a year to more than a year thinking that that's what I was going to do. And then finally, after like far too long, actually hanging out with composers, making music with them, reading their papers, watching them make music, watching them build instruments and building machine learning tools that were the things that I thought were going to be useful. Finally, it like at that point dawned on me that they didn't need new algorithms. They needed better interfaces. And by interface, you know, I think it's implicit in, in so much of what you just said. It's not about like, where are the buttons on the screen? It's about where do you, where are you able to exercise control or influence? Where are you able to um, get information that helps you understand what's happening inside an algorithm? Um, what sorts of ways of thinking about an algorithm are supported? What kinds of mental models does a piece of software encourage you to have? And you know, how does that fit into or not your existing set of tools and ways of thinking about what you want to do in music? And that, you know, I even at the beginning of that work, I thought, okay, well, that's going to be like a month of work. Um, and that ended up being my entire PhD, and that ended up being something that I'm still, you know, learning about how to do well in different contexts with different groups of users and different types of machine learning algorithms. And it was, you know, not because, not because I, you know, I wish I could say that this is because I had this great idea at the beginning and I went there. It's like, it took me so much time doing the wrong thing and just thinking about algorithms as a computer scientist that I just, you know, I ran into the wall of the reality that that was just not what the people I was working with needed. And I, I you know, I, I believe what you said a hundred percent. And I, for me would love to see more collaborations between people who are potential, you know, not just existing users of machine learning, but potential users of machine learning, because we absolutely, we don't understand this space of, you know, where ML could really fit into creative practice. Um, and it's, it's, so much of it is is composers like you who are you know doing so much work to look at things from the ground up and and developing you know ways in your own practice that that make this make sense but it's you know that's not a really you know that's not a, a reasonable solution for for most people very very interesting uh so you know we're going towards the end here um well, just to round off up what you said, Rebecca, I, I think it perfectly resonates with this idea that the technology is there, but to, to use it in this area, we need new thinking. Uh, so we, we got an, a question again from the audience through Telegram, and that leads me to the sort of uh, the last of, of the um, main topics, uh, that is agency and authorship, and, and uh, which we touched upon a bit earlier and the question I'm going to simplify it a little bit but it's basically about how the act of narcissism uh, in the act of composition uh, how is that affected by uh, those processes of automatic composition and algorithms including AI uh, how is that idea uh, affected by by this and 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 of course we can extend that question into where do agency end up a, between tools, advanced learning systems, the human becoming just a part of a network of, of creative agents, etc. And I, I'm going to keep quiet. I just wrote a book chapter called Agency and Musicking with Algorithms. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of, of this, but I want to hear what you say. <laughs> Any of you wants to start? No, I can start if you want very simply i think there is no difference in for instance never a painter has been ashamed of his brushes, but because you didn't invent the brush doesn't mean you can't do something completely outside 
of what is expected from this tool. So maybe it's just because people don't see it as a tool yet. And it's been dubbed with so many, you know, intelligent behavior stuff. So yeah. Maybe we start maybe. should start seeing it more as a tool and not having this kind of magic creative ability. Yeah, I think that's what Rebecca said uh, earlier that I think is completely right, which is demystifying what's going on inside, uh, which can lead to new creative horizons because that's the whole goal, at, at least for me or maybe for us, is to, to do things that can push the boundary of what we've, we're able to hear, to hear, sorry. So basically, I guess, when it's accepted, like, I don't know if you've seen the first presentation of uh, the MOOC synthesizer. It's a very old video where it's uh, actually a huge MOOC synthesizer inside an opera house. And when they play it, everybody is just laughing or crying or it's, it's super weird because people are never used to seeing these things. So they are kind of afraid. And I think every tool in this era has been something frightening and when it's kind of partly accepted, you can see that it's just something that will get us even longer ways inside the creative potentials. That sounds like a description of the first time uh, somebody composed a crescendo for an orchestra back in the mm -hmm. 1700s and people were just slowly standing up in their seats supposedly when they follow that crescendo because in the Baroque it was only forte and piano, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's sort of the same thing. You haven't heard it before, so it affects you, yeah. So, uh, Arte Maria, do you have anything? Um, yeah, so um, I think that AI uh, definitely invites us to rethink composition, performance, authorship, musicianship in general. But I think that's actually a very interesting talents. I don't think that's frightening at all. Um, we just have to, to reinvent ourselves in a way and just uh, understand yes. composition and authorship differently. So uh, uh, yeah, and about the narcissism, I think that was very, uh, very interesting. And I think it relates particularly to uh, works uh, that have some kind of interactivity in them. And to that, I have to say that I think that creativity is, uh, is a social phenomenon, and especially performed music. So any music that is written on a score and then performed probably by a different person than the composer, uh, it's is a creative product. So this type of musical works are uh, collaboratively constituted. And I think the use of AI just brings this aspect to the foreground. Only now we're not just collaborating with other humans, we're also collaborating with machines. But I'm particularly interested in the types of collaborations that machines have orders. So for example, all the different intentionalities that come together in this process. So I have my own compositional intention which is embedded in the score and the performance instructions in the code as well. Uh, so the software then has a sort of derivative intentionality to use John Searle's term. It has, it doesn't have an intentionality of its own, but uh, my intentionality is integrated in the code. And then you have the performer who comes into this with their own uh, aesthetics, with uh, their training, with their own preconceptions, perhaps their own biases. So it's, it's a very, very interesting collaborative process that is uh, mediated through technology. Yeah, so it's like a combination of various streams of influential agency from all kinds through tools and through tool makers, tool inventors, algorithm designers 50 years ago, etc. Yeah, Rebecca, what's your take on this? Yeah, when, when I give talks, I often end with a quote from a composer I've worked very closely with for the last eight, nine years, uh, Letitia Tsunami. Um, so very early on in our work together, I asked her to describe, maybe this wasn't early on, maybe we've been working together a few years. I asked her to describe, you know, why is it that you are using machine learning in your work? Uh, you could be doing so many other things. And, and she said, you don't want the machine to behave like a well-trained animal circus. You want it to be a bit more like riding a bull and just talked about that as, as being more fun than being in complete control. 
Riding and again, I, a bull? Is that what you said? Riding a bull, yes. Um, and and again, I think this is this isn't the only type of relationship that machine learning facilitates. You know, there are situations where you can be very much in control, and there are other situations where you know maybe you're you're being chased by the bull, right? But um, it certainly, you know, and it lives in a space alongside other techniques that draw on randomness, for instance, you know, things, much older techniques that, that allow computers or collaborative systems to have some kind of influence over the music. But, you know, machine learning undeniably lives partly in this space where we can, we can have a little bit more fun and we don't need to rely on the fiction that we are completely in control. And we also don't need to rely on the fiction that this machine learning thing is intelligent and autonomous and, you know, a, a, a truly, you know, equal partner. There are all sorts of other forms that it can take. And, and like Letitia says, this can just simply be a lot more fun. That was a wonderful summary. So, so basically the takeout is we just, just have to reinvent ourselves and learning how to ride a bull. That sounds easy, right? <laughs> two simple tasks so we have to round off uh, but i want a, a fine some final words with an emphasis just a couple of sentences from each of you where you see the future the far future of this i i would like to ask you what is the most unexpected thing that will happen in the future but if you say that it will be expected so it doesn't work but something along those lines artemi maria i want to start um, yes yeah, so i guess my vision for the future is not very imaginative so I think that the future of uh, AI lies in human computer co-creativity. I don't think it lies in the simulation of creativity. I think I've made that clear already. And I really think that its potential lies in the ways in which it can shape musical thinking. So I don't expect machines to compose music that has any cultural aesthetic value or to compose any innovative music, but I do expect that machine learning algorithms through their capabilities and affordances will inspire new practices, uh, new concepts. And yeah, that's, that's where I see uh, the potential of machine learning. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, um, I'm going to have a very simple answer and I'm going to be very, very weak in that because I'm just looking how history has been repeating itself in the sense that every new instrument and tools that we've seen has actually increased the amount of people that were doing music. And I know we are talking a lot about the meta level and the composers, which has a lot of education inside these topics. But for me, the beauty of these systems is how it can bring music to anyone. And this is something we've seen with synthesizers. Synthesizers are used by people that have no knowledge in harmony, no compositional knowledge, no knowledge in signal processing. So my big dream is actually that everyone does music and people would be happier somehow. So yeah, my hope is that music making will become central to everyone's life through this kind of processes. And as you say, I mean, the amateur, the basis of what we do as, as nerds, experts, researchers, whatever, is, is the amateur musicianship. And there's a huge, around, for example, modular synthesizers, as you see behind me, there's a huge, most modular users are amateur musicians, that they do it for their, their own enjoyment. So, yeah, I can see, I can certainly see that. Rebecca, no pressure, but you're last. <laughs> yeah, certainly, you know, I, I also hope it's the case that we end up finding great ways to use machine learning to um, make music creation uh, and engagement more accessible. Um, I, I also, yeah, I, I look forward to the point where machine learning is, is back to being like not super cool again and people stop the sort of fetishization of it and we can look at it more like we look at like filters you know, obviously the affordances of ML are, are more exciting to me than those of filters. Um, and we're going to see things that we, we, you know, haven't before, but it, when it comes down to it, it's another technology. It's a, it's a computationally supported technology that does some stuff that we can put into a lot of different types of musical systems and use, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. And when we, I think, 
collectively get back to, to recognizing that that's all it is. Um, I think it's going to be, um, yeah, we'll be in a, a better place and better able to reason about um, what we want to do with this. So co-creativity and accessibility and, and re realization that this is another class of tools where which we can apply creatively. Absolutely. That's a great summary. So thank you so much, the three of you. We're going to end here. Uh, and I want to tell the audience that at 8 o'clock, that's about 20 minutes from now, there will be a concert, which is the last concert of Insonic 2020, at the same stream link with works from composers connected with the East NDC network. Uh, and there's a piece by Swedish composer Kim Hedos called Stills for bass clarinet, electronics and visuals. Another one by Apostolos uh, Lufopoulos, who made sound and uh, visuals by Thomas Valianatos. It's called B1, about the relationship between humans and bees, a topic that actually has been recurring this weekend. Uh, another piece by Giuseppe Gavazza, 25 ambiance or 25 ambiance du confinement, uh, 433. Uh, it's a tribute to John Cage's uh, 4 minutes 33 seconds as a contemplation over the corona lockdown. Uh, a piece by Henrik Frisk, another Swede like myself, is called Image Schema, music based on an experimental video by pianist uh, Johan Fröst, uh, and uh, another by Ludmila and Lighting Gorilla called Plato's Bodies. It's an audiovisual performance staged in the old power station in Ljubljana. So have a nice little break now for 20 minutes and uh, stay connected and enjoy the concert uh, at eight o'clock. And once again, a big thank you to our panel and your beautiful insights. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 